Good morning. I am Shebra Evans. Today's date is September the 12th. I currently serve as the chair of the Communication and Stakeholder and Engagement Committee, and I welcome you all to our meeting this morning. I'm going to start by introducing, having my colleagues introduce themselves, and then we'll go around the table, introduce board staff, as well as um, our presenters today, our community partners. So I'll start with Ms. Rebecca Oven. Good morning, buenos dias. Good day, Rivera Oven, representing District 1. It's wonderful to see everyone here today. Ms. Yang. Good morning, Julie Yang, District 3. Good to be here today. Mr. Saeed. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, Sammy Saeed, student member of the board. This is my first committee meeting, so I am super excited to be here today. <laughs> We're happy to have you join our committee, Sammy. And then I'll go around to our board staff. Everybody um, doesn't always have the opportunity to meet them. They work very hard behind the scenes, and so I will begin with Mr. Fitzpatrick. Ravel D. Fitzpatrick, he, him, he is, and I'm the ombudsman, and I staff the Communication and Stakeholder Committee meeting. Very good. Hello, my name is Mr. Lipinski. I'm the communication support specialist at the board. Okay, and then we'll have our presenter at the table introduce yourselves as well, and then we'll begin our presentation very shortly. But I want, them, I want our community to hear who you are. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joseph Hooks. I'm the founder and director of 40 Club. Good morning, everyone. Ingrid Lizama from the Latino Health Initiative, part of the Department of Health and Human Services. Very good. Thanks for being here. I'll start first by asking my colleagues, are there any edits or comments regarding the informational summary? Okay. Seeing none, we will go on to begin our discussion today. So it's going to be very um, informal, just really talk. What the Communication and Stakeholder Engagement Committee wanted to do this year, so I'll start with last year. Last year, we wanted to really make certain that what we were doing is elevating the voices of our community partners, and we heard from quite a few, but this year we um, we wanted to value those voices and really have our community partners come forward and talk about um, who are you servicing? Um, how does that help meet the mission of um, MCPS, the board priorities? And just get to know a little bit about what you are doing. We often hear from our families about not um, knowing what resources are out there, how, how they're able to access them, and how they're very supportive of their families. So we just wanted to kind of share the good news of some of the organizations that work closely with MCPS and have our families know a little bit more about you. So um, we'll start with um, Mr. Hooks. Yeah. Talk a little bit about 480 Cares. Okay. Um, I guess for the record, so I... 40 Club is my small business I've had for 10 years celebrated um, this previous uh, Black History Month. And 40 Cares is my nonprofit that I have, very small, started in 2019. Um, having both has been um, great because it keeps me at the table for opportunities to serve. Um, but I'll focus first on 40 Club. Um, like I said, LLC, small business for 10 years. And currently right now, um, my main uh, services, youth services, and we're at the wellness centers. Um, I've been at Walkers Mount Gettysburg for, um, going on our fifth year, um, and then we recently joined the Seneca Valley team as it opened, and then even this year, we, as we opened up, we're at Kennedy High School now. Um, so we're at four high schools. Um, I'm currently on site at Walkers Mill with another staff member, so it's a total of four of us contracted um, through uh, working with Identity um, to focus and serve um, all students, everyone, but those that really identify as African American. Um, through those, through that platform, we are providing um, wraparound services. We have curriculum-based programs um, that have evidence, you know, results. You know, we use different curriculums like Dr. Miller's Dare to Be a King and Queen. Um, we also just support a lot of the DHHS's uh, requests to do sexual health education, leadership, goal setting, those type of things. So all of our students that we serve as a client um, take intakes and exits, but we accept referrals uh, that go through the counseling department, as well as any teacher, counselor, coach can make a referral online, and even just, you know, coming through the door. It is an open door policy. Um, it's open from 9 to 6 p.m., and that's when we're there. Um, and we do an array of programs that are really fun and integrated to be, you know, a connector, a connector to school, to services, to education, um, active listening, active coaching, and then um, referring them to 
different resources like mental health that we have partner. We have uh, True Connections in Every Mind at those sites, as well as um, many other things that um, are either inside of school or outside of school. Like if it's with Street Outreach Network, um, it could be uh, joining a club. So we try to really engage them during at risk and vulnerable times. Um, most recently, I have worked with Mrs. Jennifer Strobel, um, the out of school time MCPS to implement two after school mentoring programs that will be at Envy Middle School in Nilesville. Um, that'll be starting hopefully October 1st. Um, we'll be engaging with um, our male students and identifying male students about 15 per semester um, to serve them with the social emotional support, uh, enrichment, academic advocacy, really just trying to create a safe space for them at the school. Um, and luckily, hopefully I'll have both of the uh, coaches that will be um, be paraeducators in the school. So that's a way for me to keep them engaged during the school um, class time. So those are the two main things that I do. Um, one thing as I've had many parents reach out to me, and let me know if I'm going to talk too much, is uh, I'm contracted to serve at the schools that I'm at. So I might times have parents, and I know we'll have conversation. Um, you know, it might be Clarksburg, it might be Rocky Hill. And, you know, I have to be really very specific on, you know, uh, who, how we're serving and where, where we're serving them, but I always try to make referrals to other agencies or clubs or programs that are out there. Um, but I know a lot of parents sometimes reach out to me for just support. So those are the two main things. Um, the last thing I have is Collaboration Council. I have a small contract to really focus on Montgomery Village. I'm going to be doing a soccer program inside a mill, um, working with the safe spaces. And then um, we have, I call it Basketball for Change. It's at a Gaithersburg uh, basketball gym. Really just trying to help young men and women have um, free opportunities to do basketball clinics during non-school days um, that are vulnerable times. So those are the main components that I'm doing right now. Sure. I was just going to jump in. I was at, um, actually, a Coincidentally, I was at Kennedy yesterday um, doing, the expect, the, doing the inspection. That's part of what board members do when we've had um, construction completed at one of at our schools. And so we were in the wellness center area, and I came across two of um, the employees that are affiliated with 480 Cares. And you talk about out of school time. Talk a little bit, um, Mr. Hooks, about um, you had. You had out of, so it was out of school time, and it was tied to mental health. At Kennedy, back in the spring, you hosted an event um, during, I think it was one of our half days, yes. and it was around student athletes yes. just being able to come. And so I, I won't steal your thunder, but I will say this. Go ahead and speak to that a little bit, so that way you, it'll give people a little bit more detailed insight as to what some of the services you offer. And then I'm going to have my colleagues, just please feel free. If you want to ask a question, we don't have to wait until Mr. Hooks ends. You can just turn your light on and jump right in. This is just yeah. informal, but kind of explain that a little bit. Okay. Um, so I'm, I feel like I try to be an innovative person and being a former student athlete myself, graduating from MCPS, uh, while I was a male, uh, I found that there was, uh, sometimes, um, I'm gonna say forgotten, but not as much attention on the student athlete, you know, mental health, you know, the regular schedule, the pressure, the competition, um, that they go through. And, uh, I have connected with a few um, partners that, from psychologists to mindfulness to um, you know leadership um, skills. Um, what else? I have a kind of like a um, performance counselor um, that has done some of the um, wellness summits at Magruder and Seneca. Um, and they've been really great. And so this past spring, I was at Kennedy. Uh, I wanted to use that as a kind of like an icebreaker, appetizer, kind of getting integrated into the school. Relationships are very key. So after doing that event, many students who saw me again, like, oh, I remember you, Coach Hooks. They, they begin to trust you <laughs> when they see you. Um, and that's not where I'm from. I'm from Gummy Village. So that was a little bit out of my, my, my comfort. But I wanted to get uncomfortable and do more impact for a great school and community that they have there. Um, but the Athlete Wellness Summit is something that I'm trying to grow. Um, I did it my first year at Wagas Mill, you know, home first. Um, and I'm really trying to grow it to serve, uh, have male and female all there. Um, so it's just an example of really utilizing a half a day to keep students after school to really support something that is a hot topic they may know about or might not know about as much. Many students didn't realize how much they could benefit after the fact. It's kind of raising the awareness of mental health. Um, you know, as an athlete, even the coaches being involved has been very key. 
Um, so we're in the works of actually having a contract with uh, Gaithersburg, City of Gaithersburg, to be able to do it for the uh, City of Gaithersburg residents. Planning to do it on um, at Quinn Torture High School, hopefully on a half a day in March, I believe, um, to really have that school, Gaithersburg, a little bit of high school, um, be there. So I tried to kind of do some rounds, so I'm not just always in one spot, just show everybody some love. But it was a really good event. Um, and on the same day, we had 250 students at our annual holiday hoops event at Wagas Mill. I've been doing that for the last three years. Um, we did it called March Madness this year because it got postponed um, during Thanksgiving, but it's a time to really find time, like I said, vulnerable times after school to really uh, bring students together, um, have fun, build positive connections, get resources, um, you know, feel the love, uh, have a hot meal, you know, going to the holidays or um, learning more about each other or, or, or the things that are out there and, and partnering with other organizations. So that's, that's been really good. I'm looking to, forward to having that again. We appreciate what you do because we all we're in the business to educate the whole child, and so you do do that um, whenever you have events. What I do notice is that you provide food mm -hmm. for our students, right? Um, I know if you could, you would provide transportation, but there are times when you try to raise money to get right. um, transportation for our students, and then I was just going to um, say that. Not everybody knows, but you also were there to help support um, our students during the pandemic. So you were giving out food, like, yes. right, constantly. Yes, yes. And then I appreciate what you said, because we, we want many of our community partners to not just, we understand that sometimes you have a home and an area, right. but we do want you to spread the love across the county because right. there are many needs um, from our students and they're throughout the county. So I appreciate you saying that while you are from Montgomery Village, that you've kind of spread yourself to come down county. So we want more people to be able to do that. Um, Mr. Saeed, do you have any comments, questions? Yeah, great to see you. I know uh, we met at that yes. meeting with uh, Mentor Maryland, D.C., yes. and I was, I was really inspired by your story. And something that was really interesting to me were the students that, you know, uh, accompanied you that, that kind of had that mentoring kind of aspect. Yes. Um, I just wanted to learn more about that, like how you get, you know, students to mentor other students and kind of guide them in the right direction. I think that's a really valuable, unique program, and I kind of want to learn more about that aspect of it. Yeah, um... So, yeah, good seeing you again. You know, like I said, just trying to be innovative. I think, you know, being a student athlete again, even after college or during college, just not having an opportunity to do full scope internships. And and I created 40 Club to really create my resume, create my scope of services and work. So I saw a lot of skill sets in athletes, as if you know many from the leadership aspect, teamwork, you know, a lot of things that create what a good business person is, a good parent, a good community member, it comes from playing sports. And so a lot of them, their schedules, they didn't, it didn't allow for that. Um, I know we have great programs like uh, Summer Rise and things like that, but their sports schedules are really tough. So um, working with Department of Human Services, um, you know, Luis Cardona her t and his team, uh, the Youth Harm Reduction um, Funds, I created a program called the Student Ambassador, a Student Athlete Mentoring Program that launched in April of this year to serve, um, to have 25 mentors from the four high schools that I was in the area of Northwest, Watkins Mill, Gaithersburg, Seneca, and QO. Um, so that's five. And really, because it was at a high rise in some crime, you know, and I wanted to use the student athletes to impact the, lo the community that they're from, Montgomery Village. Uh, ironically, a lot of them played there, and that's a real hub. And um, they've been able to not only provide check-ins with them um, on non-practice days, but also come to their practices. Uh, during the fall, it's turned into like more community service, SSL, um, but they were able to earn a stipend, um, which kind of helps them stay away from any risky behavior of trying to get money in different ways, but to have money for school, you know, their football cleats, you know, put food and maybe support themselves and have some fun. Um, and so that is with DHHS, that is currently being renewed um, the new fiscal year. I'm on like a weird cycle, so it ends in November, not like, Jan not like July 1st, like everybody else with that. Um, so that was the first pilot, you know, learned a lot and looking forward to growing and successfully, uh, you know, having that program grow. We have some upperclassmen that went to college in the spring, um, after the spring semester, five graduated. And then as well, we have some freshmen. So to get involved with that, what I first did was uh, put it out there to the high school student athletes that I knew. But as I go forward, it'll be more open as slots open up for any athlete, uh, male or female, to apply that really want to engage, um, even having some funding, you know, to provide Ubers for them. You know, transportation is a big thing, 
you know, to get and see 125 kids in one spot is tough. So Montgomery Village Sports is a place where um, it's needed and parents have been really happy and, and the students have feel really empowered for themselves. Um, and I think, you know, when you mentor someone, you get something back in return. Um, and what I want to do is have a little boy or girl go to 7-Eleven and feel more safer knowing that they had an upperclassman in their school cluster that knew of them or who they trusted and someone to check on them to, um, you know, really connect. There's a video <clears throat> that I can send you guys really where um, a student was talking about quitting the football team and it was tough. And a student from Walker's Mill, Kevin Garcia, told him it was tough for him too. And just really being able to be that connector like 40 Club between the coach and the parent to keep them engaged. Because when play, students play sports, they're more than likely to be more positive, more connected, um, you know, more prepared and more engaged into ac academics as well. I mean, I wasn't really the greatest student, but I knew that if I did what I needed to do in the classroom, then I could continue my athletic uh, journey. And from there, you know, I really valued it. As my mom told me, education is really the key. So um, that's something else that is really kind of new. You know, um, I kind of got that model from Teen Works from Montgomery County Rec, but I wanted to have something more sports specific with people from, you know, students that, that we that we knew that and they went back to their own community. I think a lot of times it's great to go to different communities, but when you can pour back into your community, you're more value, you treat it more valuable and you want to make it more safer and it's a visual and and where I'm from that it needed because of a lot of the other negative stigmas that I come across in, in that area. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. And then just a quick couple quick question. How many students were involved in the mentoring program specifically? Um so total served uh ninety five youth and then 24 um, mentors. Wow. So the, yeah, it's, uh, and what, what makes us a uh, youth served is, so what happens is it's, it's a holistic thing. We, we match them with, so every student would, would get like a one to four ratio um, to be able to connect with a student. So I would have Walker's Mill all together and they're with the 8U and then they would pick out Joe Smo, you know, all that. And then we would have like um, Malik and he would have four so really creating that, um, you know, connector for them and every high school I assign to a different age group to be very consistent. Because consistency is key in mentorship, um, you know, in leadership so that they're seeing the same faces. And, and many of the parents, you know, if a single home or not having a male figure or big brother has been um, really cool and students have learned a lot. We did a debrief at USG. Um, about their experience and you know I'm looking forward to doing round two and really ideally starting it in January I mean it's a tough time um, you know based on the contracts and stuff but the ideal model is from January to June because once again their own schedule and, and uh, competition is picked up really heavy and I didn't want to have them stressed out about um, you know really not being there for the student gotcha. and then how often did they meet the mentors they would go to practice twice a week and then we would contact, they would contact them um, via phone uh, twice a week. Oh, wow. So they're like a separate dates. They'd contacted by phone. And yeah, so being there in person, um, helping them with the football instruction, you know, skills drills, kind of helping them warm up, you know, teaching them leadership so that they can be more comfortable to apply for a city Gettysburg or rec job, really building a resume. We did do a resume workshop, and then um, on the non-practice days, they would do like a five-minute check-in via FaceTime, check, say, hey, man, how's your day? How are you? How's school? what was up with practice, this is what your coach meant. And I think that's very valuable um, for an 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 year old to receive. And, you know, the upperclassmen, the varsity players that they kind of look up to online, you know, have seen more of a positive influence than a negative. Perfect. Yeah, that's fantastic. And if you ever need help with publicity, I'm always willing to help you out through social media, anything like that. So I have a Thank lot of you. students I can I can reach out to. But that's a fantastic program. I'm, I'm really happy. But I won't take any more time. So Thank you. go ahead. Thank you. Ms. Yang. Yeah. Thank you, um, Coach Hooks. Uh, good to see you again. Um, for us, um, as the Communication and Stakeholder Committee, um, my interest is how to better how to improve our process or better partner with community um, organizations because you uh, offer tremendous help um, for our school system. So if I can ask you, uh, within MCPS, uh, typically, what's your uh, point of contact? You mentioned wellness center. Is it a principal? Is it wellness center? What is your first point of contact? within MCPS. How do you get these referrals to come to you? 
Um, so 40 Club is a part of the system. So as I'm a subcontractor. Mm-hmm. Um, if anyone wants to, you know, the, the wellness centers. Um, wellness centers. It's, 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 uh, so Identity is the lead agency. Okay. Um, and so they have a site manager. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times per- people personally know me or of me, they'll reach out, but it, it would go through the way it works with MCPS is through the counseling department to the site manager and then to me. Okay. Um, but we okay. attend, you know, back to school night. I'm going to Montgomery Village Block Party on Thursday, you know, uh-huh. just trying to do um, as much awareness as possible. Social media is very key, you know, Facebook trying to promote. Okay. Um, but a point of contact, you know, I think, you know, I've, I've worked really well with some of the principals mm-hmm. and I've been very strategic about um, um, really creating those relationships. You know, I know we have two, um, Ms. Velma Walker's Mill. She was a teacher when I was there as a student. Okay. So I was okay. glad to have her back in the building um, okay. 20 years later, graduated. Right. Um, okay. Principal. That's yeah. Yes. And, uh, you know, even just stating that, um, as you guys are doing a great job picking principals, I had three, maybe four principals at my time. Okay. At Walker's so, Mill, so it was tough. So you, know. you mentioned the important thing of relationship yeah. building with the community you are serving and the leaders yes. in that community. So in that process, um, so that is a good thing going, sounds like it's going well. Mm-hmm. In this process, do you see any area that any barriers mm. that need to be removed for student assessing your help? Um, I would say, you know, the communication is very key. I think there's been a lot of moving parts and transitions in the school year and a lot of different initiatives. Um, as we have our meet and greets and with our principals and leaders, you know, there's resource counselors. I think, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of resources. I think just continuing to have people at the table, you know, if, mm. like for me in the community, but I don't know about something, it's like how does it, like how more likely does the community know about it? Mm. Um, so mm. I think, you know, mm. I can't speak for everyone, but I think the principals just um, through the wellness center stuff, I know not every school has one, so there's only six, right? Yes. So I think when you have new principals, like uh, I'll just, um, you know, when I, I used to work for the state attorney's office doing training intervention, and we used to really meet with, in a table like this, with all the principals or all the PPWs that we were at. Mm-hmm. So I think having those quarterly engagement meetings to really okay. make sure that they see and know all the information that is be able to resource to them. Okay. Now, we've had, um, you know, they're just so busy themselves, you know, we're not in the main office, but I think just continuum of um, information to show how um, we work together is mm-hmm. key. Um, okay. And I also think through, you know, we're talking to DHHS, but even through like MCBS athletics, like the uh, the athletic director, mm-hmm. really the counselors, those are key components of people to really see how in the middle is that student or that family and how everyone can play So a part. make everyone within the system aware of yeah. your service and push it out to right. the students I, that will. I don't think it's intentional, but sometimes I do think maybe there's some um, I don't say the word silos, but it's just that there's mm. needs to be more like integration. Okay. So that there's like, for example, tomorrow we're meeting with Forest family, with the social worker, the counselor, mm. the AP, mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. wellness center, mm-hmm. kind of similar to like the Wagsmo and Kennedy Cluster Project yes. mm-hmm. philosophy. I think that's really needed at okay. many or more schools to really make sure that we are tapping in and doing our part for it, for each and anyone. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. It's always good for us to hear about your experiences so we can help uh, look at ways to better promote mm-hmm. these, uh, strengthen these partnerships. Thank you. And the question has come up at, um, during the summer, MCCPTA held cluster meetings or summer meetings, and that was one of the questions that came up at the table that I was at. I was very fortunate to have a council member's staff sitting there where I was able to say, you know, we got the funding for the wellness centers from the county council. I mean, it is expensive. It's a heavy lift, but that additional um, money would need to come from them. And so that is a conversation that we've had. And based on um, these past few years, the priorities, some of the cluster projects have kind of got pushed back, but this is a really good reason why we should bring it back up. So just real quick, and I'll say this, just 
it's, it's funny. This morning, I literally just signed a form from Identity Inc. that my daughter gave me that she got from counseling to be, I signed it in advance so that she ever needs to come down there to get any kind of services that she will be able to do that right away. So mm -hmm. um, I do see where it's coming home to the families to have the families be able to sign in advance so if the student needs that service, they can do that. Mr. Hooks, I don't know if you said it, but how do families sign up for your other programs that are separate from Identity Inc. where you're the contract, like for the ones that you named, you spoke of right. earlier, how do families right. sign up if they want to be able to do that? Um, then I'll go to Ms. Rivera. Oven. So, you know, I think um, just to quickly go back to when I stepped in during COVID and created food distribution, I was kind of doing the less data. Now, course tracking is very key. But for me, a lot of the stuff that I do um, that's outside the community, it's just a Google form, um, consent, you know, having all the information. I try to be as easy as possible so that, you know, people can get what they want fast as possible. Um, I know that families in, um, in our community are difficult because, you know, we, we still burn a lot of paper. So I would say kind of getting things digitally would be very key and faster to get a return. You know, I think you know, identifying that every student doesn't have the same home dynamic to say, hey, mom and dad, sign this, bring this back. It's kind of tough for some of them, but, um, you know, I think even just sharing, uh, even about that packet that you're talking about, that you are eligible for that one year after high school and also being able to serve your siblings through the health, somatics health side, which is very key. So if you have a ninth grade student at Kennedy, your nine-year-old could get eye screening or scans from the wellness center um, so a lot of times, um, until they kind of have that first engagement, you know, I did have a principal, I would just say in middle school, they asked to text me one day and said, you know, what is the wellness center? You know, and I think like if, if, if we need to know more in our cluster, like, and I see how like the block party, for example, we have the schools getting together more. I love what the community schools are doing. You know, they're doing a lot of promotion awareness and, and positive things. So I'm really happy to see that, um, we're out there, um, but I think just letting people know, um, you know, how to sign up. I think, you know, like I said, there are some programs for me. Um, when I put stuff out, it's like I said, a link. Um, it's either a form, Google form. It's kind of, I just try to make it very accessible and easy as possible. Okay. So then we have your information, yes. joseph.hooks at 480club.org. You have your number listed, and then um, you're on Instagram at 480 Club, and you're on Twitter as well. So I don't see your Twitter, but what we'll do <laughs> is we'll make sure that we put your information in our board doc so the families want to access it. But you're right, our principals have been charged with being out in the community more, so they are doing community cluster events. And so what we'll try to make sure or, re or reinforce or reiterate is that our community partners, mm -hmm. if they're able, that they can join. And mm -hmm. I know that they have but just really being intentional about the services that we know some of our students need to be able to have access to, mm -hmm. making certain that they're there. Um, and so I'm giving um, Watkins Mill a plug. They're having a block party, mm -hmm. um, big shing ding on September the 29th, I believe. No, I don't got to get that date. No, right. it's this Thursday. Is this Thursday? Yeah, okay. MV, MV Middle School. It's this Thursday. It's this okay. Thursday. Right, right. So I'll that's an opportunity. And you'll be there? I'll okay. Be there. So if you want to meet Mr. Hooks, come to Watkins Mill <laughs> block party. Yeah, I'll be there. Um, like I said, <laughs> on that mention program, I'll, one thing I thought about with technology, kind of like what the Food Council does, and I'm, I'm on a sports advisory committee, is maybe even creating an app where I can say, hey, I'm in this district where I'm at this school, what are all the resources and links to? So if I was at Walker's Mill, I could say resources. I'm Walker's Mill. And I would just click it and I realize, oh, okay, I didn't realize they, you know, students, so this is where they're at. You know, we talk about meeting where they are. People are walking past forms now. You know, they want to see stuff faster. And it text alerts, reminders, you know, you get all these little newsletters from county council. Like, I think getting an app maybe for per school, middle school, um, maybe elementary for the parent where they can sign up. I know we have parent view and stuff like that. Um, I would just say I had a student athlete share to me, they signed up for football, but then they didn't click the link for, like, off-season conditioning. So then the coach had to create a club just for the students to be able to work out. So it's it's little things, and I'm glad you guys are getting f voices and feedback because there's there's – a lot of attention to detail, but sometimes that detail has created other barriers okay. to just get the simple things, like I say, the great things that we're doing done. So I think an app would be great um, to make sure that, because things change and every school is different. Every school is different, you know. Sure. Okay. Thank you. And so we don't want to forget about Ms. Um, Rivera Oven before we go on to Ms. Lazama. <laughs> 
Um, Joe, it's great to see you. See you uh, we actually met during the pandemic. Yes. We did a lot of the food insecurity of county and and joined forces. Yes. And so thank you, thank you for all your work. Um, but I, I just want us to be um, very much aware of the limitations of funding when it comes to programs like yours, right? Because we can advertise your program and be like, call, you know, this is a great program. But can we just be frank about the fact that there are limitations to it? I think 95 students is great, but in a school system with almost 163,000 students, I could just see you working full time at Kennedy High School. Literally just right. Kennedy High School, with the truancy issue they're having, you would, you would run out of time. You would probably need to hire more staff in order to tackle. So, so for somebody who has had a program, an after school program, and how hard it is to pe make people understand mm -hmm. how cumbersome it is to work with young people who have a, s a whole sort of issues not just the education component, but the emotional, the trauma, and then you add the pandemic to that, right? It's very challenging. So although I love the fact that you're a partner, I wanna make sure that we are partners. I don't want this to be a one way because I have seen you struggle with transportation, um, which should not be an issue. If we're gonna be partners, let's be partners. If you need transportation for those young people to do something positive during the weekend, to do something positive after school, let's find a way to do it. Because um, I have seen your pain. And I know you're being very gracious coming here and putting faces yeah. saying, you, you know, but you know me, yeah. okay? Um, I just think we need to be, we need to put the cards on the table and say, Okay, what I'm doing is making this little of a difference, but guys, I can make this much difference if I were to have the tools and the things that I need mm -hmm. as an organization. Because we know right now that our truancy numbers are not getting better, they're getting worse. We know as a fact that we have issues with mental health in our community, especially with the black and brown kids. We know they're not doing very well academically. So as far as I'm concerned, it's hands on, everybody. Everybody has to put in their share. So I commend you because I know you love Montgomery Village. I know you love your community. You're a proud Watkins Smell graduate. You have the most adorable little girl. Um, oh my God, that cheer, when you do that cheer video, I mean, it's just too, too adorable, it's just too adorable. But at the end of the day, I also know that we struggle in the area where we are with after school places to even to even congregate with our kids. Mm -hmm. And I know you and I have been talking about it, and we talked about it a while ago, even to have like a decent baseball field mm -hmm. for our children, a decent basketball area, a decent place where kids can congregate in a safe way. So please don't lose that. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that part of the advocacy is really important, and it's also very important to teach our children. Right to empower them to become self-advocates themselves. Right. Because this is a big system, but at the end of the day, we need to be very deliberate right. about where we are making differences, but we need to put the money <laughs> mm -hmm. where the needs are. Right. Um, so, somebody say amen. Yeah. <laughs> amen. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, I just wanna say, Personally, thank you, because I have seen you work. I, you rolled up your sleeves. You were out there with our community. You did not give up. It was an honor to work with you and still to work with you. We'll, we'll be working side by side with the Upcounty Hub on, on Thursday at the Black Party in Montgomery Village. But let's not forget about the needs that are still not being met. Right. And like I said, I, I thank you for, for making the difference in those children's lives and those young people. But I just want people to understand the bigger picture that is the need is enormous. Right. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to send more people to you, mm -hmm. then let's also be, you know, 
let's let's step back a little bit and be like, is Joe going to have what he needs to be able to meet the need? There is absolutely nothing more awful as somebody who runs a nonprofit or who wants to answer to a need than not to have the resources to be able to do that. Because when we do this kind of work, we pour, we pour everything into it. Absolutely. We put our heart and our soul, right? And when you cannot meet that need, you can't sleep at night. Am I wrong? Uh, <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's been tough, you know, even getting to 10 years. I, I thank you for saying that. I think even Mr. Sahid's asking about the numbers. Like, I was actually driving here, and I was thinking about what I was, I was like, am I being impactful? I mean, I know I am, but it's like there's so many. There's so many. And, um, you know, what I would say is when I get asked to go to different parts of the county, different schools, obviously it's a capacity thing, you know. Yeah. It's a capacity thing, and um, you know, just recently got married, got a two-year-old daughter. Um, you know, my wife is Peruvian Dominican. You know, I have an Afro-Latino young girl, but you know, I think that if you really look at the numbers, I reached out to Elijah Wheeler, who I connect with from Collaboration Council, and I asked him. I said, "Who else is a black-owned small business youth service organization?" And he mentioned, you know, um, Mr. Lovely Howard Pride when they've, you know, they're not as, as much in the school system. And I kind of got afraid that there's no way that typically in business you want to be the only one. I said, that's not good that I think I'm the only one. Mm -hmm. From the black male perspective, right? And we say, how many black males in Montgomery County? Mm -hmm. And so if I pulled the plug today, then who would be there for them tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so I, I had a kid come get a backpack mm -hmm. and I had him hey, how was your, you know, just some open-ended questions, and he goes to share how his dad was murdered and mm -hmm. didn't have food in the house, and through those conversations, we were able to connect in the resources and some mental health referral. But I would say that um, that's why I've been really intentional where I'm at, because without relationships, I wouldn't get as far as I can go. Um, been doing it for 10 years. I was in a school this year saying, well, I mean, I'm kind of saying the same thing, and I would just say that, yeah, transportation is really big. You know, as I'm working with Ms. Strobel, who's really great um, for out-of-school time, we are looking at transportation, so the activity bus is available, but then we have the EBB bus that might not be available. So I think people working together to help just get the kid home is key. And uh, I know there's um, so many policies and safety procedures, but I think looking at the holistic of how to really get the job done, because we something I don't have. Um, even just staff, you know, I'm serving on this ground now. I would be a better director if I could be a director. Um, but I would say to really, um, I'm talking to Rockville High School tomorrow to the ACES program about this entrepreneurship and leadership, and I want to impact them with some motivation and experience to say, you know, I didn't know I was going to start a business or a nonprofit. That wasn't my plan. Um, but things happen through passion, through pain, and that's when I kind of use it. Yeah. We're on the same boat. So, you know, I appreciate you saying that. I would say just to, as um, you guys have great staff members doing research, is to really look at making sure that the plate is as equitable as possible. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. as a black young man, I feel sometimes that, honestly, that we are sometimes forgotten about. Yeah, and, 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 and sometimes that is a hard conversation to have, mm -hmm. but it's needed right. in order to be able to find solutions, right? Because mm -hmm. not everything is, is rosy. And it's not especially after the pandemic. So I just want to say that we also need to take care of those who are taking care of our people, mm -hmm. in a sense. So we need to take care of Mr. Hooks as right. well. Right. So we don't burn him out. Right. So then at the end, we might not even have that, right? right? So we need to support nonprofits like you, mm -hmm. right? And if we can do it with something as transportation, that's a good partner. Mm -hmm. Because when they were alleviating something that you really have no access to, but it is such an important tool for you to be able to do your job right. and be able to provide that safe space and that mentoring to, to so many young people. Absolutely. So I I will, who am I talking to? <laughs> my, my wonderful people from MCPS up there. Everybody yeah. <laughs> they can hear you, right. Yeah. I just wanna say, you know, let's, let's make sure we do that because um, we sometimes, as big systems and government, sometimes we're like, oh yeah, Joe will take care of it. Oh, he has a great program. Oh, he's amazing. And we forget sometimes that Joe also needs the support yeah. and the tools to be able to do the work that he needs to do. So yeah. at least I know you have our 
Yes. Yeah, I've, I appreciate all y'all. That's just, why Mr. Hooks yeah. is here. Yeah, the pandemic, um, Sheba's someone who I've connected with a um, long time ago, you know, had coffee. Same with Ms. Yang. You know, so I think um, building relationships has been key for me. And I feel responsible sometimes, you know, I'm on a, even on the anti-hate task force. We have a meeting coming up for youth to attend. Um, you know, I, I, I think... Uh, that's just been really awesome. You know, I've, I've just tried to build that relationship and rapport. Um, you guys have always been a text or call away. I think for me with MCPA specifically, like you asked Ms. Yang, like, from I'm assuming that the board is obviously the, uh, I want to say the overseer of the MCPS, but yes, yeah. yeah, is the oversight. But me having a personal contact with MCPS saying, what do you need? In the parameters that I'm serving, I think it would be great. Who do I call and reach out to for MCPS? I know I can reach out to y'all, mm -hmm. but if it's someone I can connect with MCPS, um, like a Miss Strobel, who's been very open-minded and very welcoming and new, just to figure out, I'll just say one principal told me, um, I apologize later than to, instead of ask permission. You know what I mean? Just like, let's figure out a way to get things done. Mm -hmm. If it's a kid in a summer school, hey, let's enroll them. We need to stop closing the door. Like I said to the council, we have so many parameters through concern of ways to make kids leave, but then where are they going? And that's why I'm advocating for something in Montgomery yeah. Village. But, but if you're not part of, you know, we need to create more health. But also even working with other partners, I'm actually meeting with um, trying to create some financial um, literacy workshops, really asking our youth, what is it that you would like to see to be able to stay? Not always forcing a, like I said, the data down their throat. like. If it's a cooking class, if it's a, you know, I don't, whatever it want, they want it to be, I think continuing to have that, and that could be through an app, through a link, through a survey, through forms and assemblies to really, um, and create that. You know, I, I actually asked um, one time, and I'll move on, is how many teachers stay after school? I know they have their own life. How many, how many of them statistically are a part of extracurriculars? How many of them run a club? How many of them are leaving at 2.30 and saying, I'm out? And I, they deserve that. They work really hard. They're underpaid. You know, um, obviously, I was thinking about school yesterday, 9-11. I remember the classroom I was in when I heard the news. But my favorite teacher, Mr. Torrance, who's retired, he always would stop curriculum sometimes and read the room and say, what do we need to talk about? Very good. Call Kate, white man, great man, basketball coach, you know, old school. Wouldn't make it in these time and days, with, you know, um, with the parameters. But I think... Uh, really celebrating the heroes and champions you have in these schools, like the um, Mr. that passed away from Kennedy. These people are getting more and more out of our students, and they need to be supported as well, because we partner with people like them to do the work that we do. The teachers that allow us to use their classroom, the teachers that promote our programs, the teachers that might send an email or follow up on a referral, those are the ones that make this job easier for us. And celebrating wins, I think, you know, I've tried to make that happen more to myself is, Parents need to see positive news. So I do post a lot because I think we have so many. Like I said, I posted it. Hey, South Lake and Nilsburg in new schools, let's celebrate. But if something bad happened, everybody's down your throat posting, tagging. Mm -hmm. So I think we, the more of that goes out can get people in a positive mood, which helps their social and emotional. So I thank you thank for everything you. and being here. Absolutely. Um, and so never question whether or not you make an impact, because you absolutely do. Mm -hmm. and it's just that competitiveness of, like, you know, every day trying to show up and show out, you know, but I, I see what you mean. I, I'm, I'm humble. I'm happy. There's kids that I feel like I've definitely helped, but I think it's that competitiveness, like, what am I doing today? And even being here today, I feel accomplished of speaking and sharing. And then, like, it's always, like, tomorrow. It's just kind of like short-term memory, I think, has been key. Um, I, I sure, I'm sure we all go to bed at night saying, well, was it enough? Did I do enough, right? Mm -hmm. But um, definitely there's an impact and wanted people to really – meet you, know what you do, hear what you do, and see the kind of impact you do on a small scale. And, and like and like Ms. Rivera Oven said, my colleague, how to take that on a bigger scale and be more supportive. So absolutely, that's why you were here. Um, but I know that we're, we're kind of running behind a little bit, but it's so, like, it's, it's a good conversation. And I'm going to 
move to um, Ms. Lazamo, Mr. Hooks, if you have to go, please feel free to get up, but we would love for you to stay and, and chime in, right? Yes, absolutely. So we have Ingrid Lazamo here from the Latino American Health Initiative. So good to see you. Thank you so much for the yeah. invitation. And you could have jumped in too if you needed to to respond, right? So yeah, it's not a one person goes, and then the second person, it's all together. So um, talk a little bit about the services that you're providing to our families, our students. And Thank, thank you so much for the presentation. It's wonderful to hear about all the wonderful work that you're doing, um, especially since you also mentioned um, DHHS, identity. Those are also um, our people, <laughs> the people that we work with. So the Latino Health Initiative is part of the Department of Health and Human Services. It's under the Office of um, Community Affairs. We are one of the three minority initiatives. It's the Latino Health Initiative, the African American Health, um, Health Program, and the Asian American Health Initiative which I know that they're also going to be presenting today. Um, just here to share a little bit about the 11 wonderful programs that and services that we have um, at the LHI. Um, I have provided you with a handout of the point of contacts for our programs, their email addresses, and their phone numbers. Just to go um, briefly down um, on the list, we have the asthma management program, which focuses on providing asthma management um, sessions for parents parents of Latino children with asthma, and we work wonderful with the collaboration of the MCPS nurses. Um, they have been our longstanding partners for that. Um, prior to COVID, we used to hold those sessions at the elementary schools, mm -hmm. but after COVID, we started to switch them into a virtual classroom. We have about four classes, four workshops per semester, led by our wonderful colleague, Dr. Luis Aguirre, who's um, a doctor in his um, home country, Bolivia. And he works with a cohort of nurses, so they provide um, follow-up care to them. They do home visits just to reduce the, um, the number of um, hospital, emergency hospital visits for children who have asthma. So the goal is to reduce, uh, to provide the education that parents often need um, when their child is diagnosed with asthma. Ms. Lozama, can I ask you a quick question? Yes. So are you only working with schools that have a linkages to learning or whoever reaches out to you that has a, um, a need for you to come in? Usually so we work with linkages to learning. Okay. We have um, provided presentations about our program, uh, the asthma management program, to the linkages to learning coordinators, but we do work with any MCPS schools that reaches out to us. Okay. Yes. Um, the next on the list is the Health Promoters Outreach and Education Program. We have a wonderful um, group of um, health promoters who are our volunteers. They're out meeting out in our community where they are at, at laundromats, at bus stops, just providing health education. But they also work wonderful with bringing um, our information to the back to schools at MCPS. So wherever MCPS provides us an invitation to the back to school nights, we usually attend to provide fun games, free giveaways, have them spin the roulette so that the kids and the parents do quick um, activities. But to utilize that space to also do um, a little bit of outreach and engage with them about the services and programs that we provide. Um, next on the list, you will see the um, Community Health Worker Certification Program. This is our new program. Um, we were um, very fortunate to work with the Department of Health from Maryland, the Maryland Health Department, to get certified to provide these free trainings to community members who are interested in becoming community health workers. Um, one of our goals, too, is to also um, lead them in have them have the expertise and knowledge to also reach out to the families um, in their communities to teach them about health, about well-being, but also to seek better job opportunities as community health workers, um, even if that means joining some of the community health clinics or also joining some of the staff at MCPS. 
Um, next on the list is our annual uh, health fair, Ama Tu Vida. Uh, we provided a free annual health fair here at Montgomery College across from here. Um, that happened August 6th um, in conjunction with the Salvadoran American Festival. Um, we were very lucky to have MCPS be, be one of our vendors. They actually had three tables where they provided information about MCPS, but also the Head Start program and how they can get involved and register kids for, for school. So and thank you. Just give us an idea yes. how many people went to that festival. To the festival, we have about 3,000 people that joined yeah. um, throughout the day. Um, our, the health festival was just from 12 to 4 mm -hmm. p.m., although the actual Salvadorian American festival happened from 11 to 7. But it's a nice um, place to have the community gather and come and learn about community vendors and Hopefully next year you will be able to join us. <laughs> this is a couple months ago, right? Or maybe like... Just last month. Last month, right. Just last month. Uh, great opportunity to reach out to the parents, especially, you know, with the upcoming um, school year and to also promote the back to school fair that you guys also had. Um, next you will see on the list... Um, the youth wellness program. Um, that one, we actually have a, a contractor, which is Identity, which Mr. Hooks mentioned. We work with them to provide um, this after school program for middle school age kids. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity for them to just learn about leadership, learn about health and wellness, and just to stay active after school. So the contact information for that one does change because it's a contractor and you can reach Ms. Flor Alvaro um, Alfaro, sorry, from Identity to, for, to enroll them. So the way that we usually um, get the community involved is either sharing them the information of our point of contacts or also um, referring them to our contractors. Um, you will also see the um, Por Nuestra Salud y Bienestar Mental Health Services. As mentioned um, during the pandemic, um, there were a lot of things that arise. One of them was mental health, you know, just from being isolated and being at home. So this is a group, uh, this is a service that provides um, non-clinical emotional support for parents and their children. Um, they work primarily with the wellness centers since identity um, does work with them and um, they provide you know just a safe space for either parents or their children to share about their um, well-being and quick question actually about yes. the latino youth wellness program so like one what schools are you were you in for that since it's after school program um so for the latino youth wellness programs they they work usually with the down county and with the uh, up county, which would be Gatorsburg, and then we in um, we in high school. Um, those are the two that I am aware about. I'll be more than happy to share the, the entire list with you. Okay, and and what does that program usually look like when they come to the after school program? Like, what kind of you know activities? Because I see like they teach about leadership skills, social emotional learning. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm really curious, like what kind of things go on? Because I always like seeing after school programs for students. I think it's a really great opportunity. So kind of like, what does the format of each of those days look like for an average student? Sure thing. So they do have a um, a curriculum. Um, um, the focus is more on, um, give me one second to look for that, all the information. Um, the curriculum phase, um, focuses on health needs in the areas of behavioral health, reproductive health, substance abuse, nutrition, physical activity, and also parent-child relationships. Um, a lot of activities just kind of very informal, just keep them engaged and keep them talking. Um, and they also provide them with... Um, more more support on how they can also advocate for themselves. Um, but they also have a component for the parents so that they also advocate for their children. So, um, Ms. Nazama, thank you for being here. Now, um, as I look at the whole system, I'm looking always looking at ways to improve access for our students to reach, you know, activity, help, resources. Now, I want to pick your brain a bit. You are the expert in the field. So uh, you mentioned uh, down county, up county. But as we know, um, mental health issues is 
across the whole county. And now even looking at a school like North Bethesda Middle School, you have 15% Latino youth, you have 13% African American youth. Um, so how do people who are not in super concentrated uh, schools or area for one demographic group to access uh, resources. So how can we be better partners? What is your capacity? What help do you need that we can do this together? Thank you for that. Yeah, so we're a small team. We're only 14 people, but we have we count with uh, with the assistance of wonderful staff, community health um, educators who are really about grassroots work and being out in the community. Um, it'd be wonderful to just kind of reach out to all the staff and let them know about the work that we do. We try to uh, alternate schools um, by semester so that we are reaching out different people, not just servicing the same the same um, schools and communities. Um, it'd be wonderful to just share with them about the, the work that we do, bring them the, our either our asthma management program, but you will also see on the flyer that we also have a climate and health program. Um, I think that that's one of our newest programs that really does have an impact on both families and kids. Not only do we talk about um, climate and health, but we also engage them with a fun Zumba class that both parents and family and and their kids can do together. Oftentimes, um, you know, we focus on programs that are just reaching out to the kids, but we, and when we add the parents' components so that they can do it together, um, it's a lot, a lot more effective just so that they have that little time to spend together, sometimes during the day if parents are working after school so that they can work together and, and you know, enjoy the time together and do exercise. Um, more than happy to do as much outreach to the MCPS staff so that they can contact us. So that tip of rotating service areas and um, that is um, very valuable, right? So that um, it, it doesn't matter where you live in the county. I think people feel more comfortable sometimes reaching out to people that share their language and culture okay. and and, and so that we can do a better job on connecting. Thank you for sharing. You're very welcome. And, and just to add to that too, um, if they need um, a follow-up that we cannot provide them with the services, doing that warm handoff. Um, it's so key, it's so important. Um, oftentimes, because as you mentioned, language, um, we have to make sure that the person that we are referring them to speaks their language and is able to provide that follow-up for them. Mr. Bear Evan. <laughs> I'm very biased to the Latina Health Initiative because I was one of the people who was there from the inception, from day one. Um, so um, in that sense, it's an incredible stuff. It was started by Sonia Mora, who's now a special assistant to, to our county executive. Um, and we started very small, and then we got the Welcome Back Center to make sure that we had a pipeline for folks who were nurses in their back home countries to be able to actually, because and I think we were right. Like we were able to get a lot of nurses certified, and good thing too because then you know we had the pandemic hit. Um, but again, um, since I'm a little bit biased to this group, I have to tell you the work that the Latino Health Initiative did during the beginning of the pandemic with um, the Col Salud and Bienestar, um, how these organizations, Identity and others, including myself, we came together and we went to the county and said, we need to find a way in order to be able to vaccinate and get to the people in a different way. Mm -hmm. So we kind of changed the paradigm. Instead of having people come to us for services, we went to them. Mrs. Rivera Alves, I remember standing with uh, the people from Latino Health Initiative in front of Korean Corner on Vias Mill yes. at the beginning of the pandemic, yes. sending out flyers yes. to get and people to vaccinate. I remember that clearly. We work very, cl right. very closely with, with our agent partners and with the African American partners. We also help them to put together their, you know, their proposal so they could also give funding. So they could also work within their community. Um, 
and it was wonderful that it was received well by our county government. But what I'm trying to say with that is that we learned from that change in paradigm that when you go to communities, there is a reception that is different than when you just open offices between nine and four or nine to five, and you expect these very hardworking communities to come to you for services when we very well know that they are working and they're not really accessible. So the paradigm change that we did was that we went to beauty shops, to bus stops, to um, places you know where people bought their ethnic groceries, to restaurants, to car washes, and we went not only to do testing, but then when the vaccines came out, we were there. I don't know if you guys remember the, the trailer that we had at Lake Forest Mall for months, including a couple of years. If you wanted to get tested in your car, you just drove through. That was one of the Latino Health Initiative partners. Um, and, um, and it was a good thing, because we showed that there is this perception that communities are not interested in programs, that they don't come, you know, that there's no need, therefore they don't come to programs. But that's, that's not true. That is not a fact. They don't come because the services that we provide sometimes are not doable during their, their time of need. So we learned that evening access, weekend access actually works for so many of our community members. Um, so for that, I, I am forever grateful to, to the Latino Health Initiative. But again, I think Ms. Ingrid is being very nice when we talk about capabilities of what we're doing. And Mrs. Yang's question about the, the youth wellness program, right? I think we would love to, to hear that you are at every high school with everything that's going on with the whole issue with truancy right now. And yet, we're rotating, right? Which is a nice way to say we don't have the funding and we don't have the capability to be able to respond to this great need. So therefore I will say it, Ingrid, <laughs> not you, so I'm not gonna put you on the spot. But that is the reality, folks. The fact is that we don't have the adequate funding to be able to do this at a more um, greater way to be able to have an impact on an issue that is only going to get worse. So although the goodwill, and like you said, it's a mighty team, there's 14 people in it, but did you see everything they do from asthma prevention to uh, diabetes to the wellness center to all this stuff of interpreting, right? And this is a big county in case you know we don't realize and they cover the whole county Absolutely. which is why in the area where i have grown up and i live in the up county we get short change on a lot of these services not because they don't want to it's because they just don't have the capability to be able to provide these services. For example, at Clutz for High School, we have a large ESO population. There's no wellness center, right? But yet we have, you know, close to 300 kids who could use that kind of support. Either, you know, Mr. Hook's support or, or the Latino Health Initiative. So what I'm trying to say is that the issue is a little bit bigger. And though we have these services, let's be very um, realistic about where and how they're being given, right? Because if it was up to the staff of the Latino Health Initiative, they will be at every high school, not just at schools that have linkages, because we all know there are schools that are very borderline farm schools that are not community schools, are not farm schools, but the need, you can palpitate it. You know it's there. You walk through those hallways and you know the need is there. So can I ask a question? So you said that you have um, 14 people that are working with you. Um, you're in the middle schools. Can you tell me how often you get to a middle school, like twice a week, or just what does that look like? So the information for the Latino Youth Wellness does come from our contractor, the 
the Identity Inc. I do not have that information, okay, that's me, but I will okay. get it for you. Okay. Um, we work again with Identity to also deliver our family reunification um, program, which focuses on recently arrived youth yeah. and to reunite them with their families. Uh, we make sure to get that information for you, but we are really trying to reach out to our entire Latino community, oftentimes because they fall through the cracks of the yes, system. Yeah. And I, we are trying to meet that gap. I think from your present, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, from, <laughs> We're a lively group. <laughs> from your conversation, I think what I took out of, like I'm most impressed and take out of it is like the, the partnership you have. Like you invited MCPS at your festival, okay? And you come to our back to school fair. So that, um, that partnership of elevating um, each other's voice and services, it's very valuable because when you come to our back to school fair or our back to school night, you are reaching to our families. Right. When you invite us to go to your fair, you make it more targeted for us to, to serve those families. So I, I take from this presentation that, uh, you know, with all our partners that um, invite us to go to the things that you host and, and reach out to us or, or let's invite you to come to the things that we have. Yeah. Yes, and so we always talk about how we can't do this work alone, mm -hmm. that we need our partners. Um, what we what happened last last year on our committee, we invited our um, partners at the state level, the county level. We had um, Senator Nancy King, who's a former school board member. We had Council Member Will Jawando, who chairs the Education and Culture Committee. So we'll make sure that we bring our partners back to, to have a discussion about um, how we collaborate with community partners, but there's still a great need, right? So when we do a better job of communicating and messaging to them the needs of our school system and how we have that additional support from community partners, but what it looks like when community partners can get more to do more, um, that helps us too. So what I will say is some of that funding does not come from us. It comes from the county, right? And we want you to be able to get more funding to be able to help us in the areas where um, mm -hmm. where, um, uh, not where we're not able to get to, but just where there just needs to be more um, supports and resources. So I do appreciate all of you coming. Mr. Hook, you have a question. I know that yeah, libraries just, needs to sorry, get Sorry, randomly. Um, no, it's okay. This, our community is growing so much, and like I said, my daughter's biracial. I just wanted to know, like, do you have to identify, like, how do you qualify to do work with your organization if you're biracial, you know, does it have to be full? You know, I'm just wondering how this is that makes them eligible if they have any or because like they can go to African American or they can go to you or they can go to both. But just wanted to know um, if you guys run into that where students are just biracial and still getting services. Well, some of the youth programs, they're run bilingual okay. uh, because oftentimes, even though they are Latinos, sometimes they prefer English. Uh, but most of our programs, at least for the parents, they are in Spanish only because they, they, there is a lack of um, programs in, led in Spanish by, by Latino instructors. So um, schools usually are the ones, the, the counselors are the ones that usually refer them to the, to the youth um, wellness programs as much as um, the other programs that we have. I do want to highlight that, um, you know, we have been working with um, the, the, the MCPS staff, the PPWs, or I, I used to call them the Parent Community Coordinator BCC because that's what I <laughs> call them. Um, they're such a wonderful group of, of people, um, but like Mr. Hooks mentioned um, during his time that you know, there's often transitions, um, so we do want to reach out to all the, the this year's staff so that they know that, you know, we have wonderful resources and programs that they can also refer to, and that way we can um, reach more people. Um, as Ms. Evans also mentioned, we were very fortunate to have um, Council Member Will J. Wando come to our health fair and actually have a table there so that he can see the dynamics of, of the impact that we're trying to reach um, our community. And um, yeah, that way we can all work and collaborate together. Yeah, yeah. I think it's different when you're able to actually see. Right? And if you said that you had an event where there were 3,000 people, right? Um, 
that speaks volumes. Um, there are a million residents in Montgomery County, but as Ms. Rivera oven stated earlier, we have more than 160,000 students in our school system, um, probably more than 162,000, but we want to be able to um, make certain that the ones who need the support are getting it. Right. And that we're and not. Just, and just to finish off, you know, during COVID-19, we started to build up our platform. So on social media, Facebook, it's the number one platform for our Latino community here in Montgomery okay. County. So we have been sharing information about um, community resources and with you. You guys who also have a community guide in Spanish that we have on our website. It's our number one download. Um, but also we, we have partnered with MCPS um, last year to share a lot of the communication efforts that you were pushing um, in Spanish to our community. Okay. Thank so. you, Mr. Hooks. We appreciate you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, no, thank you. And then we do have um, your your information. I so see you have a QR code as well. We're going to make certain <laughs> that um, if you have any documents that you want us to be able to put online, that our families will be able to access that as well. And um, just want to thank you. We really thank appreciate you so taking the time to come out and speak with us and share the services and that you just provide. Just ask Ingrid if she could send us the blueprint, um, sure. especially for elected officials and so on. The blueprint is something that we worked on really hard. Every you know, we put it together, and it's kind of like a guide of the things that we have we see that are coming and the voids of the needs. So it's, it's wonderful to have for. Okay. And we'll I think it would be wonderful to have for our leadership team at MCBS. Okay. We'll and Ms. Lazama, we're going to put your name up in the board doc. So if you get, um, uh, if there are emails or calls and they reference you, I'm, I'm sure you'll know who to forward it to. Or if there's a name that you want us to put in this system, we can we can do that. But we'll make sure that we share that with everyone. So thank you so much thank for you. coming. Gracias, yeah. Ingrid. And at this time, we're going to ask to come to the table. Montgomery County Public Libraries will have J. Tyler Chadwell English, Ms. Anita Vassalo, and Jamie, Jamie Flores. Jaime. 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 <laughs> Jaime Flores. Good morning, everyone. Come on down. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Anita Vassalo. I'm the director of Montgomery County Public Libraries, and I have with me today Assistant Director for Programs and Outreach, Jaime Flores, and our Teen Program Services Manager, Tyler Chadwell English. We're very happy to be here. Sure. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Glad you all could join us. I heard that um, we had some doing the healthy thing. You walked over here, right? <laughs> They're, they're no, no, nope, nope. Yeah. You're yeah. fine. Yep, yeah. you do what's best for you. You're here. They said six minutes, and then halfway down, I said, "Oh, twenty minutes." So no oh. way. Oh. <laughs> oh. You say tomato. Well, I say tomato. It's okay. Steps in. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so we were very pleased to be invited to uh, present to the BOE about the type of resources that the library system provides for uh, children, actually from birth up through. Um, high school and of course our mission encompasses all ages and all people within Montgomery County. So the things that we wanted to focus on uh, today are some of the resources that we have for elementary school children and also um, for teens. Yeah. So um, we have a um, an early literacy and children's program manager, also Ms. Cassandra Malik, but she wasn't able to be with us today. So I'm going to um, mention some of the things that Ms. Malik thought were most important for you all to know about. Um, some of the resources that we particularly have, um, you know, we have things in our buildings, of course, and we have uh, 20 full service libraries throughout the county, as, long, as well as one library which is the Noise Library for Young Children in Kensington, which provides service for birth to age five. But in addition to the physical presence and the physical staff, we have many, many, many resources that are available online to 
every person who lives here or attends school in Montgomery County, and people can uh, access a library card online. So there really are no barriers to the use of the library's resources for the population. You also may not be aware, but uh, a couple of years ago, we stopped charging fines for library books. So there are no charges. Um, you know, we had found that sometimes families would accumulate a um, pretty significant amount of money in fines, and that would in turn um, stop their use of libraries, which was definitely not what we wanted to do. So that policy has been in place for a little while. A um, couple of things that we wanted to highlight in terms of our online resources that are of particular interest to students are um, BrainFuse. The project is called BrainFuse, and so there's BrainFuse Help Now. This is an online resource that provides live online tutoring, so you can work with a tutor, an actual tutor, um, online. It also provides homework help, a lot of dis different test preparation and writing assistance for customers of all ages, but there are focused um, resources for elementary and high school age children. And then uh, we also have the BrainFuse job now, which is live on online coaching, interview coaching, resources for resume, interview prep, and career planning. And of course, as our um, teens move into uh, the last few years of high school, they may be thinking about employment, and we can provide resources that help them with that. And again, I should mention, because people are not always aware of this, everything that the library provides is free, entirely free. Never any charge for anything. Absolutely. Um, we also wanted to let you know about our summer reading challenge. The library system runs a summer reading program Love every that summer. Program. Love Great. It. And we have changed it a little bit over the past couple of years um, in order to also uh, provide community support at the same time that we're running the summer reading program. So instead of um, kids and teens working to get a, a prize, a plastic toy or something like that, they work to um, support um, organizations within the county. And this is funded by the Friends of the Library, Montgomery County. This past uh, year, our Summer Reading Challenge participation was the highest that it's been um, in the past eight years or more. Uh, we had 14,138 children and teens uh, participate, which was an increase of over 1,000 children from the previous summer. Um, I'm sorry, can you say that number again? Mm -hmm. 14,138. 14, and of course, the partnership with MCPS that we have is really uh, extremely important to the success of our summer reading challenge. Our librarians go out into the schools before the program begins. We work very closely with the media specialists at all of the schools to promote the program. And actually, uh, this year, the kids could sign up before the program even started. So they could work with their media specialist or perhaps their um, you know, English or reading teacher in order to get them signed up for the summer reading program. We also do a winter reading challenge. This is in partnership with uh, the Washington Wizards. This is for elementary age students, and the Wizards have a program uh, to promote literacy across Maryland, D.C., and uh, Virginia. So um, they earn badges. Um, they can participate in events. So that'll be starting off uh, later this year. Later on uh, here this fall, we have the Maryland STEM Festival, uh, which is across the entire state, a month-long celebration of uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. We'll be hosting a lot of programs during the STEM Festival. Um, that'll be throughout the library system. It runs between October 13th and November 11th. Um, a particular item that we have picked up over the past couple of years that I do want to mention uh, that circulate from the libraries are our PlayAway launch pads. These are tablets that are preloaded um, with games, instructional games that are generally focused on a particular topic. They're for kids uh, preschool through sixth grade, and they do not require Wi-Fi or internet for their use. So they're 
its curated content includes educational apps, games, video stories, and uh, we're piloting that this year. So they're available at the following libraries, Long Branch, Maggie Nightingale, which is up in Poolsville, Marilyn Praisner in Burtonsville, and White Oak. Um, Nothing we, up county? Well, would you consider Maggie Nightingale Poolsville up county? Yes. Um, no, but yeah, okay. <laughs> I, 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 would, I was thinking more like the Germantown cases. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, let me say one more sentence. Okay. We'll be providing them at all libraries this fall. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, we started with the East County. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and the last thing that I want to mention for the younger kids is a program called A Thousand Books Before Kindergarten, in which we um, track and give prizes to kids who read or have read to or sing or um, something else with interact with a thousand books before they enter kindergarten because um, we know that success in kindergarten and success further on academically and also as children move into careers is based so heavily on early, early literacy skills, really beginning at birth. Um, we have another program that I'd like to mention, which is called um, Hatchlings. Again, this is a pilot program that's supported by the state, where we have trained librarians work very closely with expectant parents before the, um, before the baby even comes, to let them know how important the early literacy behaviors of read, sing, talk, write, and play are so that children can acquire language, so that they can understand that, that? on uh, a written page, the writing moves in English from left to right, that those black squiggles mean something, uh, and so that they acquire the vocabulary that they need to be successful in kindergarten. Ms. Chadwell, English, can I ask you a quick question? Do you have anything that you can share with the school system that we can possibly, like sometimes what we do is there's a rounder in the elementary schools in the front office mm -hmm. where um, I have this small car, we have brain fuse, but the, the you know, Literacy is very important to the board as well as to the school system, mm -hmm. one of our huge priorities. But the part about reading a thousand books before kindergarten, like how could we better promote that or share that with our families? Um, so we're addressing know. the question to Mr. Chadwell. Well, whoever can answer. Okay. Whoever can answer the question. So the question is, do we have rack cards for that? Or do you have something that we can be able to um, hand out? Or? Yeah, absolutely. We can provide you with that. Sure. We can make sure you have that. Where Would we send it to the main office? or? So I'll well, jump office. ahead. I'll, um, I'll, I'll be able to send, you know what, um, I'll, I'll, I'll see how so we've been working with Andrew Christman, of course, who is okay. is has retired, unfortunately. So um, she has someone who has um, supporting her role of the supervisor of all the media specialists. The media specialists are generally our contacts yes, to the school, absolutely. and and they should remain here in Montgomery yeah. County. We are blessed to have a media specialist at each school, yeah. so we can send information out you through. Yes, yeah, certainly we yes. can do so that. I want you to continue mm -hmm. to use the contact that you normally would mm -hmm. use. It would just be great to be able to share that, right, um, with our families, and particularly as um, families are coming to not just only these families, but the families when they come to register for kindergarten, it'd be great to share that information. And then we have our pre case programs that we would like to share that with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But oh, thank you for coming. I really do appreciate that. And I know that in the past we've had a partnership with the libraries and trying to make sure that we put a library card in the hands of all of our students. Mm -hmm. But I just thought it was good to get a refresher on all the services that you all mm -hmm. are providing. And I will say that, and, and it really came about, not like it, we don't always think with a library, but I have a daughter who loves to read. And um, while she wants to go to Barnes and Noble, she will go to the library and get 10, 20 books at a time. But I saw this summer, you had some fabulous programs and she couldn't take advantage of it because of the activities that she was doing, but it was around um, like writing workshops, like creative writing. And so anything that we can do to continue to enhance the skills of our students would be is great. And then I will say that um, during the pandemic, it was lovely to have um, 
our students and our families to be able to go into the libraries to get the library books. And I do believe your policy came about that when you were letting everybody take the library books out, there was no way to charge people, right, for the late fees. Well, actually, we had started with children the year before. Okay. We just were moving on to everyone. Well, you so moved it to the It wasn't really as a result of the pandemic. It was okay. something that we had wanted to do. Um, but the extension of the um, being able to continue to... What about how you allow people to check out a book like two or three times and right. there might be a fee, but then when you return the book, the fee goes away? No, there's, how does it, this how does is it how work? it works. Sure. Um, there's automatic renewal of all our materials. So you yeah. check out a, a book initially for a three-week period, and then it is renewed three more times as long as no one is waiting for it. So you can actually have the book out for 12 weeks. Now, if after that you hang on to the book, then we declare it lost. Mm -hmm. And the charge is the replacement cost of the item. But once the item is returned to us, that goes away. So, okay. yeah. All right. Are you interested in hearing some things about our, our teen and youth initiatives? We I don't know how much time. Uh, you know what? So we're on, we have a, we have an ending time for our meeting, but we What's your do tend time? to go over. I'm at your pleasure. So I want you to continue on to share. Okay. I thought you were in a rush and that you were on time. No, I just okay. talk fast. Okay. <laughs> um, continue share. Let me have um, Mr. Chadwell English talk about our team. Hi. Yes. Thank you so much for having us today. I'm new to my job. Um, my position is new, and we are doing some really great things with teens at MC, uh, in Montgomery County Public Libraries. That's probably the number one thing, right, is we have a ton of resources. We run a ton of programs, and the, the biggest barrier that we have is getting that information out to That's your right. students. Mm. You have, you have the people we want in our programs, mm. and um, our media specialists specialists do a great job of sharing that information and um, we have began forging really great I think we have had in the past and continue to forge really great relationships with that I've um, been asked by um, Andrea Christman and um, some of her colleagues to come to some really great um, workshops and networking opportunities for their social so I've gotten to spend time with your social media specialists um, and presented them multiple times already just in a couple of months um, but some great things that we're doing with teens that I just wanted to highlight in terms of resources you know we have things for college prep test prep um, online homework help um, workforce and career resources and volunteering information and I just want to highlight um, we're really working towards you know helping teens find that next step for them and we want to make it really clear that you know a part of our mission isn't just to help prepare them for college although that's awesome that's amazing too um, but to prepare them for college to prepare them for jobs prepare them for careers we have a really um, exceptional um, building trades program that's that we've um, been working on right now we've got a relationship with them and they're doing presentations to students about that and so we've got a lot of opportunities for young people to come and learn um, we are we're piloting this the, well, we're not piloting we are continuing this fall to work with spark business Academy, um, Academy town <clears throat> uh, for entrepreneurship and business courses mm -hmm. Um, and we've had we've done some partnering with WorkSource Montgomery to come and bring their bus to our to our um, parking lots and work with teens on resumes and um, interview practice to get those first jobs. Um, I also wanted to point out one of our big initiatives, our teen advisory boards, which is a leadership opportunity, and it's an opportunity for teens to shape library programming in their own image. Um, that's incredibly important, not only for teens in general, but for teens in Montgomery County who are very diverse, which you know. And so them coming in and, be, and informing upon the kinds of programs that we can do, they get SSL hours for for participating in it. It's one of my favorite programs, um, bar none. We, we bring in guest speakers to talk about um, different topics for them, and then they get to shape the programs um, and help build them out. Um, I also wanted to mention, um, in terms of our partnerships with the schools themselves, um, our assistant director of programming outreach, um, Jaime, has brought some really amazing spe and diverse speakers to contemporary conversations, which is for teens and adults, but get a lot more adult attention um, there in the evenings. Um, but what he has done, which is so wonderful, is every time one of those speakers come in, we take them into one of the local schools, and we've moved around to different schools all throughout the county, and um, we have 
we have sat that those speakers will present to those students, talk about what a career in the arts or literature is going to be. And similarly, I'm having um, on November 11th as a cap to our STEM festival, Art Tech House is coming to do an installation at Connie Marilla. And we're taking them to two high schools to talk about career in the arts that isn't necessarily being an artist. So talking about being a, in marketing and outreach, being an engineer, a computer scientist, and how um, you can be interested in the arts and still work within the arts and, um, and, and be surrounded by it every day. Very good. I just wanted to touch on some things that you mentioned, because if, if, you know, it's, Tyler says, you know, the Contemporary Conversations is world-renowned artists and writers. So just to give you an example, um, and they do the, they're doing this for free when they come to the schools. We, mm. They're already booked to speak in the libraries. So we bring them to a high school to speak. Um, for example, we had Cherie Renee Thomas, who's worked on the Black Panther Marvel franchise, uh, is one of the leading uh, science fiction editors, come to speak at one of the schools. We had uh, Tahim Bajess, who's a Pulitzer Prize winner, yeah. who also spoke to students. Karen Washington, who um, sustainable sustainability farmer. Uh, we had, um, for uh, Pride Month, we had Emmanuel Xavier, who just published his third book, uh, highly respected in the LGBTQ community, who talked about his poetry journey, also talked about being uh, one of the founders of the, of the Vogue Ball House community. Uh, we also have Reggie Kabiko, who's worked in, in the D DC metro area with, with uh, teaching poetry and writing workshops. You know, brought them to these to the schools, and the students were just ecstatic because it was not just about what these artists do and writers do, but how the careers that are available. Right. Uh, you know, Sheree Rainey said it was interesting because um, after she spoke, she was mobbed. We had about sixty or seventy students <laughs> in the high school, just not only for for her uh, beautiful journey as a writer, but they couldn't believe that someone of her stature was in front of them, right. you know, saying, look, these are opportunities for you. Um, there's a couple of the pieces um, that um, we've done just to highlight the last couple of months. We just celebrated our Just for the Record of Vinyl Festival, which is one day dedicated to all things uh, record culture. But this year we, we expanded, we became the first library in the country to feature a, a DJ battle, a scratch battle, with DMC level DJs coming from the entire East Coast to compete. Oh my goodness. Uh, we had uh, free workshops from everything from music production, songwriting, wow. we had kids uh, art classes upstairs uh, in, in uh, the BG branch. Um, I mean, it was, uh, even the CE, I think we have footage we just released of the CE actually was hanging out with one of the DJs at one point. Um, um, you know, just enjoying, just couldn't believe that a library was doing this. I think that, you know, people think of libraries in one way, right. and they forget that we offer all these things that are here. But the focus was on teens and kids. We're repeating something similar to that. We have MoComCom, which is one of the yes. largest Comic Cons um, in Montgomery County. But this year, uh, through a, 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 a state grant, we're doing Blurtino at MoComCom. Blurtino comes from the word blurred, black nerd, nerdino for Latino nerd. Uh, so we're doing Blurtino at MoComCom. So we're going to have programs specifically targeting black and Latino youth, particularly what's happening with teens in the county. As you know, those are populations that we want to speak to. So you're going to see some of that programming uh, happening as part of, of Com com. And um, we're also uh, uh, about a month or two away from launching uh, the first, I think we're the first library in Maryland that has an, out, an all-electric outreach vehicle. Mm -hmm. And that was through a state grant. And that, that outreach vehicle is to bring library ser services to those areas that just may not be able to access the internet or may not have be able to get to a library. Um, and that's with my outreach team, which by the way, you know, we only have uh, four programmers and four outreach uh, professionals for well, you the library system. you based on all the things that you're saying. This is awesome. But, oh, my know, one thing that the CE, Anita, and the CEO have done is make sure that, you know, the, the folks that we have in the library system, you know, I can honestly say that we probably have some of the most um, talented, educated librarians in, in, in the East Coast. I mean, Montgomery County is a highly respected library system. Mm -hmm. um, people know that, you know, our folks mm -hmm. are they, they bring a wealth of knowledge. You know, Tyler was a, a, a former teen librarian at, at, a, at a, was it Frederick? Was Frederick. It? Yeah. So he, he comes and brings that experience to our county and has grown our teen programming uh, exponentially. Uh, so this is just a summary of what we do. It's not the, the say all and be all, but we have to give you a quick glimpse. You know, we, we, we move fast because it's like, how can we give you all this information yeah, this and be respectful of your time? Uh, but that's just a, a taste of, of some of the program we do. And then last, 
October 11th, I, I want to make a personal invite to you uh, and, and to uh, those who are interested. We're having our Hispanic Heritage Month celebration uh, at Rockville Library from 6 to 8 o'clock. We have Dr. Tony Medina, who will be the keynote speaker. If you don't know Tony Medina, you probably <laughs> heard about him because you know Amanda Gorman. Him and uh, Amanda were the two were the two authors were banned in Florida. Their books. Yeah. Tony's was interested. One was uh, a book on Langston Hughes, a children's book, yeah. and the other one was I Am Afonso Jones, which deals with. Uh, uh, race and, and other is teen issues. Um, so he's uh, the author of about 20 books. He'll be speaking. This is absolutely free. We will have food at the event. We'll have music, a reception to follow from 7 to 8 at the Rockville Library. That is completely open to the community. Excellent. We're making an invite to you and to all those, you know, who are interested uh, in, in libraries and what we do. October I just want to okay. also mention October since we... October 11th. 11th. Since we have other partners here, we're working um, across, county, across the county with um, innovation to work on a teen mental health week um, yes. in March. It's The date's not set yet, but we really want to work. And I think some people might have already been reaching out to the to the Latina Health Initiative and some of the other health initiatives that we have. If not, um, please come find me afterwards because we we are we are gathering people together because we recognize the, the issues and the crises that our teens face. And they look at a lot of behaviors and they look at a lot of, um, you know, truancy and other issues they're having. But I, I, I strongly, I strongly, strongly feel that it starts sort of with their mental health situation, and um, we're hoping that this can launch something for it. That's going to be in the springtime. That's in the spring. And then the event on October 11th, uh, and I will take all credit, it's actually in partnership with the Office of Racial Equity, Social Justice, oh, yes. Office of Human Rights, and Office of Community Partnerships. Mm -hmm. You know, we were doing our Hispanic Heritage event. You know, we reached out and said, listen, why are we doing this? And you're like across from us. We should all be working right. together Silos. to celebrate our community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been, I'm part of the Latino Communicators Group, so I you know, get, uh, been working to spread that information with Jesse and a couple other folks mm -hmm. in the county. Uh, but that's just a glimpse of what we do. I, so, um, do you, questions? We'll be, yeah. we'll be happy to take the questions. Yes, Mr. Saeed and then Ms. Grace Rivera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Go ahead, um, yeah, great, great program uh, that you guys have here. Um, I'm actually, it's, it's really exhilarating whenever I hear anything related to youth. And, you know, you guys seem to really have, you know, everything really down. And so I had a couple questions about some things you mentioned. So when you say you guys are coming to schools, what does that look like? Is that an assembly with an entire grade, the entire school? Are you going to classrooms? Are you going to club meetings? Like when you say you guys are going to schools, how many students are usually there? What does that look like? Just so I have it, an idea. It depends on what the school wishes. Okay. So we either can have um, a librarian come and speak at an assembly with all the students there, or they can come and speak to one class and then be recorded mm -hmm. so that the recording can be shared. Uh, so I, I can't give you an overall kind of figure. It really is whatever works for the school. Okay, and what kind of, are these middle schools, high schools, elementary, or all across the board? It's, it's all across the board. It's where we can get in. Um, you know, is the administration able to work with the librarians from the particular library in order to make this work? We also, of course, go to the um, back to school, the big, big back to school event okay. that's held in the late summer. And we have outreach team members there letting people know about library resources and signing them up for library cards. We share this huge spreadsheet with um, MCPS's uh, media specialist, and we assign librarians and uh, media specialists and we kind of line them up so each school has a connection between their media specialist and a librarian at a branch that is near them and so we use that as a huge tool to um, get into the schools and sometimes we do lots of different types of outreach and then you have like something like contemporary conversations would be based on um, you know we try to well I try to target um, uh, high schools that, that have large black and Latino populations mm -hmm. because that's one of our targets as part of our strategic plan, um, which has four, four pieces. Um, and that's going to be based on what the media specialist and what the school wants. But we really want students who are interested in the subject, right? It's not just, let's just have a big, huge, you know, mm. assembly. We want, no, we want students, if you're interested in a career in writing, you know, this would be perfect for you. You know, those are students that we want to address. Or we have, you know, for Pride Month, we know there were schools that had strong uh, um, LGBTQ um, initiatives in their school, you know, to educate that population. So 
that's that's how we it's it's a combination of things when it comes to that specific program. But as Anita mentioned, every every school's different. It's going to be what their needs are, and uh, you know what are the exact resources they're requesting from us. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ms. Veda Oven. Thank you so much for um, your presentation and your passion and your dedication to our children and youth of this county. You're right. I think our library system is one of the best in the country. Um, I grew up with it, um, one of my favorite places, and then my children. Um, you know, that was part of our, it was like religiously. We went to the library twice a week. Um, Mr. Flores, thank you for the outreach, especially into the black and brown communities. I think, you know, that is really needed. Um, and I just wanted to share with you my experience that I had this this year with your, uh, with your system and how wonderful it was that they actually went the extra mile to make sure that, you remember when um, Montgomery County was given out the computers, the free computers? Yeah. In order to get a free computer, what, it, what was it that you needed? Library. A library card. Mm -hmm. And it had to be for every every member of the family. It could not just be the parent. It had to be for every child that was getting a computer, you had to get a library card. Where in my community and where my nonprofit uh, works, um, there's a lack of Wi-Fi. So um, huge issue for black and brown communities in, 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 this, um, in this area. So they could not access, um, and then some of them even had issues. If, even if they could access it, language was an issue. Um, we have, a, a, you know, some of our parents cannot read even at a first grade level, so that was an issue. So just a lot of things. So we reached out to the Germantown Library and we said, we have this population, we want to get them signed up. Mm -hmm. So we, we signed them up for the computers, but now we have, we need the card. And um, they actually blocked the time for our families and we actually got transportation from the trailer park and the Hamptons community. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know if you remember that. Oh, I remember it quite well. <laughs> yeah, we reached out to Ride On yes. to arrange this yes. uh, so that we could transport the families yes. over to the library in Germantown. Yes. So yeah. I just want to tell you thank you for going the extra mile to ensure that our families felt included and welcomed mm -hmm. um, and not felt, you know, like, okay, you know, that's your problem. If you cannot get here, that is your problem. Sorry, right? Well, you want a computer or not? You, you go get it. <laughs> because it wasn't just about getting the car, but it was about feeling comfortable walking into your building. Mm -hmm. And that vulnerability that a lot of our families feel of not being able to do things on their own, but you're welcoming staff, assuring them and validating them, hey, you're part of our community and we're going to treat you, you know, in a supportive way made the difference. And I want you to know that now my little people, especially in those communities, they are faithful visitors it's of wonderful. their Germantown library. So I would love when this mobile comes around for you to put the Middlebrook community on your list mm -hmm. and for you to put the Hamptons community on your list. And if you have any flyers you want to give out, there is not just the county hub, but there's other seven hubs around the county that see these communities and we work with these communities that are, you know, traditionally not easy to, you know, infiltrate and not easy to reach out, but who really could use these services. Um, and especially that program that you have, the 1,000 books by mm -hmm. kindergarten, that is such a vital program in my opinion. And as you know, we started all day pre-K in some schools. And you can tell the difference in kindergarten, the kids who had pre-K and the kids who did not, immediately on the first day of school. Yeah. So I hope, I don't know if that program is also in a bilingual way, but if it is, that, 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 that is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And we definitely have some families that we can refer to you. Great. But I just want to say thank you so much for having such an incredible staff who really, really sees the needs you guys didn't say no. You were like, okay, let's work on this together and let's make it happen for these families. And we did. And now we have loyal followers of Montgomery County Public Libraries, which thank is, you, That's you know, wonderful yeah. to hear. Yeah. So thank you so much. And thank you for the brain fuse. I had no idea this existed till today. Um, this, 
say how amazing Brain Fuse is. <laughs> As a teacher, you can go in and Brain Fuse and create something that you can share a link with your class. You can create um, like a slide deck that has like flashcards in it. You can create pre-tests. It's an incredible resource. Mm-hmm. I hope that our MCPS gurus out there (laughs) are able to share this with our staff because we do have a large number of new teachers this Mm. year, especially in our elementary school community. Uh, And we also have quite a new librarians into into the school system that Mm -hmm. they're, you know, this is their first year in MCPS. This is an amazing tool. Like, I'm even going to make sure my niece takes advantage of this as well. And some of my moms who are trying to learn English and so on, I think this is absolutely wonderful. So so, so thank you, and it's yeah. free. Yes. I mean, it is free. All, all our resources, I mean, this is one of many resources we have on our website, and I want to give kudos to our digital strategies team. We works really hard to make sure our digital outlets are distributing some of this information, whether it's social media or the website. But you'd be surprised how you know, many folks go on our website and say, I did not know libraries did this, right? Yeah. And I think that, you know, any way that uh, we can work with you, or, you know, get that information out there, um, you know, please let us know. Again, you know, the, w- the website's a great resource um, because there's not just for searching for the books that you're looking for. Okay. Uh, and not, not all the books are printed. We also have a digital collection. I know. Hoopla, I know. Yes. Uh, and some other offerings. So yeah. um, anyway, we can um, work with you to get that information out. Please let us know. Sure. It was so great to have you all come and speak with us. What you can do is our point of contact in the board office is uh, Mr. Ravel Fitzpatrick. And then um, he will help us to connect with the various departments in um, in central office. Um, in so just thank you for being here. I just have, it does, you don't have to give me the answer now. It can be in a follow-up email. I'm very interested to know your capacity, right? For example, the help now, the live online tutoring, what is your capacity? This is, this is with... Brain fuse. I mean, it is the online help is provided by that particular resource, um, and I do not know. So it doesn't actually. So so we don't have a specific capacity. There are certain times a day, specifically, it's 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 ranged to be after school until a certain time of the evening. So that in in that case, there are some capacities in terms of when you can have live help mm-hmm. um, but they have what BrainFuse does as a company is is they have folks all over the entire country right working in these different centers um, all, all um, vetted out and accredited to to be online and helping so what they do is you pop up and it's just like almost like um, when you visit a store and you get that AI helper, only it's not AI. And you know they say you say I have this math problem, and they bring up this virtual whiteboard and they say this is how you do a problem like that. Here are the steps, and so they will. That is how that works. But on, okay. on, a, on the next level, then you also have free classes through Udemy, LinkedIn, which a lot of folks don't know that you can get with your library card through our system. So if you're trying to do workforce development, there's a class that you want to take, mm-hmm. and it's in Udemy or LinkedIn through the program that we have. You can mm-hmm. access them for free. Okay. So hopefully to more specifically answer your question, we haven't ever reached capacity that we know of yet. Okay. That's very good to know. That's <laughs> very good to know. We're going to work on that. Right. Got, um, library tested. staff helping with the tutoring. <laughs> right. Yes. Right. Brain fused. Yes. Right. Brain fused. Right. And I know that... Um, you uh, library has become a resource hub. Like people get their write-on cards, uh, strips from the library, and you have display our artworks of our MCPS. So I, I value this partnership, but I'm very curious to get a little bit data later on in the follow-up. Uh, you said that you got rid of the fine system, right? The uh, for students. So. Um, the physical impact, and did you see the outcome? So how do you measure the success? Do you see the increase of uses? Do you see people returning? Because I'm interested to see how policy like delivered the the outcome. So there's a reason you remove that as a barrier, but what outcome did you 
did you get, is there, uh, I know that it has only been a year. Yeah, it hasn't been a very long time. The outcome mm -hmm. that we were looking for was an increase in the use of our resources, mm -hmm. increase in the circulation of the materials, mm -hmm. and an increase in the number of people um, applying for library cards and using them, which is what we refer to as an active user, mm -hmm. someone who actually engages with the library through their library card within um, a rolling calendar year. Mm -hmm. So um, I know that when library fines are Remove, there is a concern. Um, people will never bring the stuff back. They won't care. Uh, that has not been what was found. I mean, this was not a decision that we took lightly. Um, the library board, the Montgomery County Library Board, was tasked with researching this. We're not the first library system to do it. There are many throughout the county, and I think that more here within the state of Maryland are moving towards. Um, removing library fines because it's basically just a punitive measure exactly. that drives people yeah. away from the use of a service that they should be able to use. Now, in case you're wondering, um, if you don't return the materials mm. and uh, the materials that you have at home are worth more than $25, you're blocked from doing anything with the library. So there's that okay. impetus to return the materials to the library. And we have not seen um, a huge increase in our loss rate. And I will remind you really that the use of a public library in terms of the borrowing and returning of uh, materials is basically a social contract. Mm -hmm. Because right. Right. anyone can walk into any of our buildings, take anything, and walk out with it. Right. Right. So it, it's really good um, to hear this, and I would like to know how it's working and, you know, its impact. Um, in our public school systems, we also have student obligations. That can be many things. Mm -hmm. In the past, it can be AP test uh, funds, you know, or, or other other. Library books can be one of those obligations. So it will be interesting. I'm trying to see the implication your programming and that can um, inform best practices in the field. Anecdotally, and I know this isn't putting numbers in front of your face, but anecdotally, um, I have seen, I, I have seen for myself in branches the number of young people who come in and say, my parents will let me get get books now or check books out because there's no there's no reprisal right that we had parents who were saying no you can't check it out because I don't know if I can bring it <clears throat> I can make sure it comes back and so I know that's anecdotal not statistical but anecdotally I have seen I have seen that over and over and over again where we have um, families who may not be able to afford fines be more likely to let their their young folks take things out if they know they don't have to pay them as part of strategic plan we are uh, you know, kudos to our um, the, my 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 uh, the other AD that I work with and uh, that works for Anita, uh, James Donaldson. He's developing a data department. We've just uh, added new data staff. who are working on crunching all the numbers so that we have uh, a big picture view of how we're meeting our strategic our strategic plan. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's in the works. Um, so you know, when when you when you want those numbers, we will have them in terms of how that's influencing our system, not just from the from from that initiative, but other initiatives. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Then we're going to go to Miss Grace Rivera. Oh, your light is just on. You oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. Yeah, no. Thank you. I got too excited. No, thank you. But we thank really you for appreciate. Being here. Yes, we appreciate you coming today um, and supporting our mission of ensuring that our students are not only academically prepared, but they have the creative uh, problem-solving skills as well as well as um, they are. Um, socially and emotionally prepared to be able to go on beyond high school to either college or the career and you're showing that in all the many things that you do so I'm so glad that you were able to come and share all the resources that you're providing to our um, our families and if there's anything that you want to forward to us please again you have um, Mr. Fitzpatrick's email and then we have October 11th from 6 to 8 Rockville Library in our head mm -hmm. to come <laughs> And, and you all have Montgomery County Library cards, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> yes. Okay. I wind up question every day. Yes, time. yes. And if you have any further questions for us, Mr. Ravel can okay. pass on our information. And, it, and you know what? And if you are able to forward this document to us so that we can put it online, mm -hmm. it would be a great resource for our parents to be able to access this yeah, information. you can do to help us get the word Yes. Out. Well, you know what? You just did it today, right? Millions of viewers are watching.
<laughs> as we like to think. <laughs> no, thank you so much for right, your time. Thank you yeah, very much welcome. for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. No, don't apologize. No. Mr. Flory. Totally understand. And at this time, we're going to call to the table Miss um, Khadija Barclay and um, I'm going to try to pronounce Samiskshah Sapkota. You, you can correct, please help me when you come to the table. We're going to hear about George B. Thomas Saturday School as well as the Asian American Health Initiative and then the Recovery and Academic Programming. Right. So we'll go ahead and we'll get started with Ms. Barkley. Sure, good after, I guess it's afternoon now. I, I think good it morning, is now, maybe. yes. Um, my name is Khadijah Barkley and I am really excited to be here, so thank you so much for the invitation. Um, the first um, topic we'll talk about is, of course, the George B. Thomas Senior Learning Academy is a nonprofit organization um, and our signature program is Saturday School. And we've been providing mentoring and tutoring services for the students and families of Montgomery County for over 30 years. So we started in um, 1986 as an initiative of the Mu Nu chapter of Omega Psi Phi fraternity. There was a, um, a call to action from the then NAACP, and they asked um, local fraternities and sororities to come up with activities to support literacy and math achievement for black and brown students in Montgomery County. And that mission has not changed over these many years. Um, you can see there, the, the, you have a folder that has our flyers, but I also um, provided for you kind of like an overview of all of our programs and services. But what happens on Saturday mornings is um, parents can go to our website or receive flyers and registration forms from their schools, come to one of our eight physical locations or our one virtual location, um, and they receive in the physical locations breakfast from 8 o'clock until 8.30. From 8.30 until 9 o'clock, there's a motivational moment um, that really focuses on social emotional learning or sometimes brain teasers or various fun activities to get the students passionate about learning um, and also focused on wellness. And then from 9 o'clock until 11 o'clock, the students get an opportunity to have an additional hour with English language arts curriculum and an additional hour with math curriculum. Our curriculum is aligned with Montgomery County Public Schools, so what they learn Monday through Friday, we support and extend on Saturday mornings. So last year was a kind of an anomaly. Um, we were kind of com competing with Montgomery County Public Schools and their CARES Act funding and the tutoring that they were doing like in their schools or during lunch or after school or virtually. So many of our tutors departed to do that and many of our students decided that it would be more convenient for them to work just in our home school, which was fine. I mean, we have hundreds of thousands of students, and um, I can't say that our program is going to be able to meet the needs of all students of Montgomery County, but we do serve 3,000 students within a school year. Um, so like I said, we have nine centers. One of them is virtual. We're at Gaithersburg High School, Northwest High School, Clarksburg, Paint Branch, Wheaton, Einstein, and Montgomery Blair. And the, it's a cluster model. So the high schools is, is where the program is physically located, but we also serve the cluster middle schools and elementary schools at those centers. Um, in terms of numbers, we have about 160 tutors that are there on Saturday mornings. Um, we have 18 center leaders, so we have a center director and a lead tutor trainer, and those individuals are responsible for um, resources that they can bring to the centers and also making sure that what goes on in the classroom is authentic to what we're supposed to be doing in terms of the implementa implementation of the curriculum. And then the, we have um, eight bus routes um, that we are in the process of gathering information from our constituents in terms of whether those routes are really meeting the needs of the communities that we're serving. 
Um, in terms of central office, um, I am a part-time executive director for the George B. Thomas Senior Learning Academy. We have one full-time office manager, and we have a person who's part-time who serves as our program director, and then we have a development director because we are responsible for raising funds for this nonprofit organization. And um, that's our team. Um, we partner with the school system through the Office of Curriculum and Instruction in supporting the development and implementation of our curriculum. Um, I, I live in the Office of Student um, Support and Wellbeing. That's where my office lives. Um, we work with the Office of Shared Accountability in terms of our receiving data about our students, and they do our evaluation every, every so many years. Um, we work with the Department of Transportation to get our buses, um, food services for breakfast, um, editorial and graphics does our flyers, um, materials management takes the fly, after the flyers are printed, it goes, it's distributed to the schools, and then um, we're in the process now of working with the chief of schools to get all of this information spread out to the principals so that we can be strategic about who is actually attending Saturday school. The last thing that I'll share is we had opening ceremonies last Saturday, and um, we had 350 students enrolled in Saturday school, 48 students enrolled in kindergarten, and 30 students enrolled in our STEM program. Um, it's, it's a joy to see the smiling faces on Saturday mornings and the grandparents. It's intergenerational. So the grandparents will bring the kids. Sometimes the parents bring the kids. Um, but it is um, there are many different partnerships that go on with our ACES program and the students that come for SAT prep. And then in the last couple years, we've done some APIB support because we've opened the doors to AP and International Baccalaureate courses. And sometimes those students need support, especially with um, preparing for the assessments. Um, I think that, oh, one thing you asked is how our work aligns with the mission. And the mission of Montgomery County Public Schools is that every student will have the academic, creative, problem solving, and social emotional skills to be successful in college and or career. And that is totally in alignment with what we do, and especially with our motto that I believe in me. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, so I have a I'm going to go back to how long I've been familiar with um, George B. Thomas. I have a daughter that's a junior in college and one that is a senior in um, high school. So I do remember um, George B. Thomas from a long time ago, and some of the services that you're providing now like, are really um, phenomenal. And I don't know that our parents really understand um, what type of resources are made available. Tell us. Um, Tell us the costs for George B. Thomas, right? And then um, talk about who staffs the 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 um, eight cent the eight well nine. I didn't know we had a virtual one. Mm -hmm. So is that so? Go so, sure. Oh. So um, we are funded by Montgomery County Public Schools, mm -hmm. and we're also funded by um, Health and Human Services with Montgomery County government. And so the money that we receive from Montgomery County Public Schools and Health and Montgomery County allows us to provide affordable tutoring. This is extremely affordable. So I don't know if any of you have ever paid for a tutor. Um, tutors could cost, you know, 75, 85, 95, 100 dollars an hour. Right. This program is 23 Saturdays. And if students are on free and reduced meals, it's $40 for the entire year. If they are not on free and reduced meals, it's $85 for the entire year. So it is affordable. And I remember whenever we have like a budget shortfall with Health and Human Services, the, the message that I receive from parents is, well, this is one of the only things that's still affordable in Montgomery County. Why would they cut this? Well, because it is a, it is a pretty large, um, you know, large ticket item for the county, but it's because they're passionate about being able to provide these services that are affordable. Um, and who staffs the, um, the centers? They're certified teachers. 
Some of them are administrators that are leaders there. Um, um, many of them start out with us as paraeducators, and they go on to get their degrees, and then they become teachers. But just during opening ceremonies, most of the teachers, like most of the tutors that are there, have been there for five, six, seven, 10, 15 yes. years on Saturday morning. So yes. each center has its own essence, um, but they're all very much supporting of the communities that they serve. Absolutely. And I'm fully aware of that. I saw a picture recently, and I thought, I think if I identified half of them being at some point um, at Harmony Hills Elementary School. <laughs> so they are, um, I just want our parents to know that they're staffed with our very own um, yeah. And, certifi and, and certified teachers. teachers. And teachers, right. 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 And, so and many of them and many of them teach the mm -hmm. curriculum during the week. So they know right. where the where the points are where students struggle. But they also know where the points are where students need acceleration, yeah. which is just as important. Ms. Grace Rivera. Thank you. Um, I had um, the honor to work with Mr. Thomas and when he was just talking about this program, where it was an idea and a vision, um, we all thought it was a great thing. And I remember when he started at Gases for High School, and I was actually one of the tutors, oh, and wow. Teresa Wright, and yes, uh, yes. and yes. Um, so this is very close to my heart. Um, so a couple of questions, because I, I still think one of the biggest barriers for a lot of our kids is transportation. Mm -hmm. And um, although my, my kids graduated from Clarksburg High School, mm -hmm. you know, go Coyotes, and I, and I love them dearly, transportation it's in that area is challenging, Yes, especially on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. uh, it's challenging during the week. So it's more challenging mm -hmm. during uh, the weekends. And it's even worse in the Damascus area, mm -hmm. uh, where there's really no, no public transportation at all. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, 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 you mentioned that you were looking at the routes because I was seeing that um, uh, there were a few schools missing in the up county, um, including Watkins Mill High School, where you could have a lot of kids just walk mm -hmm. to to the high school like they, like they do at Gaithersburg or Wheaton, some other some other schools, mm -hmm. or even now Seneca Valley mm -hmm. um, or Northwest. But so. How how are you looking at, at at that? How can how can we how can we be you know better partners in ensuring that we are meeting uh, the needs of some of those kids in those areas who have a high need of um, of academic support? Um, and even though you know forty dollars is very affordable, mm -hmm. I have families with three or four kids mm -hmm. who you know pay an upfront. A hundred and sixty dollars or so on can be a hardship, especially mm -hmm. for my moms who are single moms. So is there like a payment plan that you do for some of them? Um, that was not some of my other my other question. But most importantly, the whole transportation issue is an issue that I see as a huge barrier, especially in areas like Up County. Mm -hmm. So um, we shared um, the routes for transportation with families during opening ceremonies. And one thing that I asked our center leadership was to get feedback, and we'll work with the Department of Transportation to find out if there are additional stops that we can add to routes. Um, but it's really a partnership with the schools, because if we have a school that has 15 or 16 families, and they can get their students to the elementary school to bring them to the Saturday School Center, we can create an additional route. Okay. So we're, we're working with the community to see how we can shift that. Now, you mentioned Watkins Mill. Watkins Mill was a previous mm -hmm, center. I know. Um, and so we did postpone the opening of Watkins Mill and also Rockville because of the budget cut that we received mm -hmm. from the county this mm -hmm. year. So as we, you know, restore that funding and or raise funds, um, we'll reopen those centers. But transportation is something that we're keeping our eye on in terms of, but we didn't have transportation at all of our centers previously. No, I know. Um, the last, the, the previous administration said, you need transportation, open it up for everyone. And I was like, okay, well, we'll do 
do it. And so we're blessed to have it, but we are very much looking at um, where the need is. So is there a list and maybe this is for MCPS as well, a list of where those where those bus stops are to 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 transport to make the travel mm -hmm. from those bus stops to to these centers we have we have bus routes yes okay. we do have those um, those are created um, just based upon it, it's like satellite you know how the mm -hmm. um, the, the, the the gifted and talented programs mm -hmm. they do the satellite it's satellite stops mm -hmm. but we I want to be more strategic about the numbers of students and where the need is right. more because if you have stops where no one's coming let's shift that stop to where right. students actually are. And I are. think the staff knows where I'm going with my question. I'm mm -hmm. going to specifically ask about certain routes in Neap County including the Middlebrook community and the Hamptons community and yes. the Cider Mill community okay. and and some okay. of those um, okay. to see you know where So I think where those would be are. northwest is that correct? That was uh, North West High School? It would be, uh, it would be actually, it would be Seneca, mm. uh, Clarksburg, and, um, and Northwest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And if I can just very quickly share about the Recovery and Academic Program, or did you, you want know me what to You know what, you can. I think Ms. Jang had a quick question. question. Sure. A question. Uh, so thank you for being here, Ms. Barkley. You're so welcome. Clarify some numbers. So uh, actually... You have Maguda High School as a site before, a few we years did. back. We did. And that one closed down? It did, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So because I saw that in action. Because we did previously, yes. Okay. All right. So right now you just opened for this semester. You say 355 students. 350 students are enrolled in this, were enrolled in the Saturday school during opening ceremonies on Saturday. Opening. And the, yes. But that's not including the 45 kindergarten students? No, that's not including Okay. The and then how many in your STEM program? 30 currently. 30 in the STEM program. Okay. And the, the test prep, those open up later on or how They'll, does that? The first tutoring session is September 30th. Okay. So currently we are... It, this is registration time. Okay. So we should have at least 1,500 students by September 30th. So okay. it's it, it, every, you know, my, my email is probably populating now with right. people who are enrolling. Right. But we, we look to serve between 2,500 and 3,000 students during the course of the year. During the course of the year? Yes. Okay. okay. And I can provide specific, you know, more specific numbers for that you. Will be the Office of Student Support and Wellbeing. Mm is requesting from me now to know how many students were at, in attendance last year from every school in Montgomery County. Right. And we'll be providing that same number um, this year as well, those okay. same numbers this year as well. That is uh, terrific. And also, um, how many bus routes you have? I, I understand it's satellite, right? But how many do you run? You cover a, you are in a high schools mm -hmm. right now. How many bus routes? I believe that there are nine bus routes. I think okay. Wheaton has two in mm -hmm. every other center. It might be nine. Wheaton has two and I believe Springbrook has two. Okay. But every other, every other center has one bus route. Okay. All right. Thank you. It's, it's really helpful for me to understand the scale. That yes. Of the program. And, and it was definitely the conversation between Dr. Thomas mm. and Dr. Wiest. Mm -hmm. When we started, we were just mm -hmm. at um, the Olney Center, Olney Community Center. Right. And um, when Dr. Wiest met with Dr. Thomas, mm -hmm. he said, well, you're going to have to expand. You're not going to be able to make an impact at this one location. Mm -hmm. And that's how we were able to expand to so many, so many different locations. Right. With our... Um as the fund going away, mm -hmm. um, you know, that uh, restructuring some of our services, yes. yeah, I'm very much interested to know your yeah, I will definitely follow up with that. Thank Absolutely. you. And then can you just um, let our families know there's not a set time when you have to register that if they want to sign up this upcoming Saturday that they're it's able to ongoing, do that. It's ongoing, it's ongoing throughout the year. It's, op it's open enrollment and the, the cost is the same. So you get more bang for your buck if you start now, but if you enroll in April, the cost is the same. So, you know. All right. And then can you do me a favor? Can you um, let the board 
know when you have your opening and closing ceremony. I will. In the past, we've been able to come to see, you yeah. know, our families and see what that looks like. And at the yeah. end, be able to, at the end, usually what happens, um, do you allow students or families to share out what their experience was like? I think it's really important that yes. people hear what the students are saying. And then, the um, some, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, some of the students that have gone through George B. Thomas come back to help with tutoring sometimes as well. And we have we have volunteers, so we have current students that mm -hmm. participate for SSL hours, student yes. support um, SSL hours, and volunteers are really what keeps our numbers lower. So we have a three thousand students, you know, nine locations, and so we only have a hundred and sixty some teachers and staff members, so our volunteers really help with the pullouts. And if, if a teacher is trying to do, you know, one lesson and there are students that need acceleration and there are students that need support, the volunteers really make a difference in the classroom. Now, how do the students know that they can volunteer for George B. Thomas the or center, any volunteers? The, the center, center directors reach out to the schools okay. and, and recruit volunteers. Okay. I think we need to talk. I actually know... Uh, a group, a community group that is student tutors, they are looking for tutees. Maybe there's okay. a partnership that we can we'll, form. We, will we email one another mm -hmm. about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Perfect. Absolutely. Perfect. Okay. Recovery and uh, academic. Yes, you can do. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. So the recovery and academic program is the other program that I, um, that I supervise. Um, that program is specifically for students who suffer or have suffered from a substance use disorder. So you were mentioning earlier about our attendance challenges. Many, many students that suffer from a, um, a substance um, use disorder, you know, they're not going to school, they're not participating in life really. And so students that go to treatment for a substance use disorder and successfully complete that treatment, they're able to come, they have an opportunity to come to the recovery and academic program during the course of the day rather than returning to their home school. So they do their um, graduation requirements through Edmentum, which is an um, online platform, and we have um, retired teachers and current teachers that are there to help them with their academic program. And it's a part partnership through Shepherd Pratt and so we have recovery specialists, a care coordinator who coordinates services for the students. So a day in RAP looks like the students um, have bus transportation, a, a specialized route that will come nearby their home, pick them up, bring them to RAP. They have breakfast. Um, we have learning sessions throughout the day where they work in cubbies on their um, Edmentum courses. And then we also have recovery groups during the the day. Um, I create academic goals, or my, me and my team, we create academ academic goals for the students, and the, um, the recovery specialists create recovery goals for the students as well, and I communicate with the home school. So if a student is involved in the recovery and academic program, they're still enrolled in their home school, but they take their courses through Edmentum. And um, we have, it, it's not a therapeutic service, but we do provide um, referrals to therapy sessions, individual therapy, family therapy, um, and the like. And um, many students are dual enrolled in treatment programs and also in the recovery and academic program. So that is the first option for them to forego their homeschool activity, homeschool attendance, and come to us. The other option is for students who don't want to forego their homeschool life, and they want to um, go to their homeschool. They can also receive recovery support after school. So the Shepherd Pratt staff will pick them up at their high school or middle school and bring them to the landing, which is 640 East Diamond Avenue, and um, they can be there in the evening where they learn how to participate in life activities that don't include risky behavior. So they go to Audubon racing. They might go to um, escape room, you know, many different activities that they, that they participate in the evening. Um, and that's funded through um, Shepherd Pratt um, Health Systems. Talk about um, 
how long the, the RAP program has been around and about how many students we serve, how many students we have served, if you know that number, right, or okay. estimate, and then how many um, okay. are being served at a time. So um, we ha we st the program began in 2018, um, and I want to say through 18, 19, so that's five years. Um, probably about, we've served between 20 and 23 students every year. Um, right now we have about 11 students enrolled. And when, I, when these numbers, I'm speaking just of the RAP program, not of the landing in the evening. But about 20, 25, we have the capacity to serve 40 students every year. And that's a combination of the day program and the evening program. Ms. Rivera Oven? And how many um, kids do you have in the landing right in now? In the landing, I'm not certain about how many students there are in the landing. That's that's supervised by Shepard Pratt, but I can definitely get that number for you. Um, okay, that would be great. I actually had a visit with them, and I know they were, um, they were not at capacity. Um, and one of the things that concerns me, not just as a board member, but also as a citizen of this county, mm -hmm. is that in order to be able to get some of to be able to get into these programs, you have to be coming out of recovery, um, mm -hmm. which is almost impossible to find for our young people mm -hmm. in Montgomery County, especially um, uh, when it comes to fentanyl or any other drug use. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to see how can we can synergize behind First, coming to 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 the fact that we have an issue with fentanyl, yes, we and do. and and I although I love the Narcan training, that is not the solution because then we need to do something after that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and right now, as it stands in Montgomery County, we don't have anything for young people. Who are um, because if we did, you will be a capacity. Right. right. Am I wrong? That's, that's true because it is voluntary and it's we're not therapeutic, so right. we don't have the capacity to serve students that are actively using. Correct. Right. And so um, when we, I think when Montgomery County wrote the this particular grant, they wrote it for students who were like I said, in recovery, in recovery and looking to complete Correct. their high school. Yeah. Um, but I, I certainly agree with you. Yeah. There and is definitely a need. And just to give an idea to those who are watching, um, there are certain programs that are private for recovery, but they're costly, and they're not available mainly to our black and brown kids. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is, it is a big problem, because I'm sure we could have you busy 24-7 if we did. So just a plug it out there for folks to, to support and to mm -hmm. keep pushing for Montgomery County to actually get mm -hmm. uh, a clinic that is long due for young people. And um, can it be ignoring any, any, you know, any more of what's happening and, and young people really need that support. Right. And what I would like to share is when students come to us and they're not ready we do refer them to many different sandstone, embark. There are many different resources that are available. Like you said, they are they are expensive, and you definitely many times need yeah. health insurance and the right health insurance. Correct. So there are some barriers that are in place, but we do make significant referrals. And even for our students that are currently enrolled, if they have challenges, we continue to make yeah. referrals to treatment programs for yeah. them. I just wanted to share the challenges right? because people would look at it maybe they're going to be like, oh, they only have 11? What's mm -hmm. the point? Right. And yeah. there is because there is Absolutely. a reason behind that and the barriers that exist that we actually as adults and policymakers and people who could make a difference sure. could make a difference in those areas and be able to provide those services. Yes. So I don't want it to be a reflection on the mm -hmm. program because the program is wonderful. Yes, yes. excellent. And uh, the stuff that you do, the support that you do, mm -hmm. the day program and the evening program are amazing. Mm -hmm. I met some of the young people who literally this program in a lot of cases saved their, save lives. their lives. They say okay? it all the time, yes. So so for me it's like, okay, how can we ensure that we are doing that with other young people that might not have those resources. Right. Right? But who are 
just in great need of that support. Okay. So if we could if we could do that um, as a system and support that and advocate uh, holistically for us to be able to get those resources into Montgomery County, mm -hmm. it would be um, beneficial to to our young people who unfortunately are suffering from uh, from from drug addiction and and, and drug abuse. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Ms. Yang. Did you have a okay, Mr. Say? Okay. No. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. If, if it's okay, I'm going to depart because my students are there. At Absolutely. That. No, we've kept you long enough. Thank you so much. our time. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Ms. Sakota, thank you for being so patient. Thank and you. Yes. Looking forward to hearing yeah, your conversation you. and sharing with us about the um, Asian American Health Initiative. Absolutely. So welcome. my name is um, Samiksha Sapkota, and I'm with the Asian American Health Initiative, also known as AAHI. I'm the behavioral health coordinator there, um, and I also coordinate the internship program and had the opportunity to work with the Summerise um, students, which was what an honor, very bright students. So um, in terms of our mission, so our mission is to improve the health and wellness of Asian American community in Montgomery County um, by applying equity, community engagement, and data-driven approaches. Uh, we are part of a Department of Health and Human Services, and there are four core areas that guide our work. So that is community engagement, community empowerment, uh, capacity building, and uh, change catalyst. So um, in interest of time, I'll just kind of highlight some of the work that we've been doing. So community engagement, um, we conduct outreach to engage the community. We really try, try to partner with community organizations, Asian American community organizations, and Asian uh, American serving organizations within the county. Um, and then one of the, um, the recent, uh, for Mental Health Awareness Month last May that um, a workshop that we held was the Youth Mental Health Art Therapy Workshop. Um, so we partnered with Wizards um, and various community organization to bring art therapy um, workshop to the youth. So these workshops basically provided safe and supportive um, environment for uh, creative self-expression, uh, relaxation, self-awareness, and coping skills. Um, and the, the workshop aimed to equip the youth with valuable insight into mental health, encouraging them to share their newfound knowledge with at least one person in their lives. Um, and there were about 67 students that attended in total um, these workshops, and um, the age range was from 12 years to 17 years. And I can hear Ms. Rivera um, oven saying, only 67, there should be more. Um, and absolutely, you know, <laughs> um, absolutely. And, um, you know, we, we did collect feedback from the students and from parents, and we will be hosting it again next year. Um, it does come with challenges, you know, there's a little bit of funding challenges, there's a little bit of parents are not really willing to, you know, when we talk about mental health, it's a very stigmatized topic in the Asian American population, in, in community in general, but Asian American community, um, you know, saving the face and um, and so on. So um, this is something, you know, we, we had great feedback and we're going to continue pushing for it for next year as well and um, continue to empower and engage the community um, to, to take, take part in this as well. Um, in terms of capacity building, we create a lot of uh, models and tools to demonstrate promising practices, and one of them is the, the photo novels that I shared with you. I shared the English version, but we have six of them, and they're all translated into Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, and Hindi. Um, and if there's any community that wants to work in translating them, we provide technical support there as well. Um, especially the blue one, uh, More Than Stress, and the red one, uh, Growing Together, we actually, it, it's not just a story that talks about mental health, but we actually had a focus group. Um, for the blue one, we had youth actually come in to the table, and we used their words um, to actually narrate the story. Uh, for the red one, the growing together, we actually had the parents and the and the youth, um, you know, in the room together. There was a lot of conflicts, um, and and we we extracted that and um, turned that into a story. So we have had a lot of principals um, ask for these photo novels that we've shipped. We we do it uh, free of cost, of course. Uh, for the community and a um, lot of therapists' office, a lot of um, support groups, a lot of workshops. They use these photo novels to kind of um, lead their their programming and and have that conversation. You know, start that um, conversation as well. Um, so uh, that's kind of like the highlights um, of it. And then um, I also wanted to talk about the recent for uh, Suicide Prevention Month. We held a 988 workshop. So it's important, right? Like, there's a lot of 
um, resources that's out there, but how do you access it? And how do we encourage and empower the community to actually access it? So the 988 workshop, what we did was we partnered again with the community partners. We um, partnered with the UHPS officers and they and SAMHSA, and they provided um, speakers that um, that spoke the language of the community. So actually, um, you know, provided these workshop in the language that um, that 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 worked that that worked for the community. Um, very great engagement. We had about four to five community organizations um, that were on board for this. Um, I believe we had over over 300 um, total participants in, in these workshops. So um, so our, I think, core strength with, with within AHI is working with the community, trying to you know empower them, trying to engage with them. Um, we don't provide direct services, but um, we also, pro we've been providing grant for last two years um, for some of these community to provide the, the services as well. Um, and then uh, for October, we're working again with the community and UHPS, uh, PHS officers uh, for national, uh, uh, not sorry, national um, substance abuse prevention month, um, talking about you know some of the needs uh, either for seniors and for youth as well, and then providing the nylox and training there as well. So that's kind of um, the highlight of it. Um, so, yeah. Michelle, mm -hmm. I have a thank you for being here. I have a clarifying question. Sure. Uh, you mentioned that you don't provide direct services. Um, is it because of funding issues? Um, because I don't see you in our schools, not in our bridges to wellness or in our wellness centers, but I know the need is out there. We have heard student testimonies, and I think you have done a great deal in the community trying to destigmatize right, mental health issues. So, but I'm trying to understand the direct service piece. Yeah. So, um, so when we are invited to schools, we go there, um, health fairs, and um, and things like that. Um, we have service connections and service navigations. So, if somebody calls us, um, we provide the the language support. Um, we kind of you know dig deeper into what the process looks like. Um, so, we have somebody allocated um, to support with that. But when I say direct service, we don't do anything clinical, um, or we don't have therapists in our offices that that serves um, the. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. How can we uh, be stronger partners? Um, mm -hmm. uh, I know about AAHI. Um, mm -hmm. I do, but I also know that not a lot of people, uh, uh, you know, uh, know or utilized. Right. the service that you can provide. How can we be better partners? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the conversation such as this does help. Um, I, I think a lot of a uh, lot of organizations are not still not aware of us. Mm. Um, so just I, I, I know we're doing our best in terms of outreach, but I think just sharing the information helps, um, you know, just um, inviting us to these health fairs, these mental health weeks, mm. um, those kind of events really helps. Um, if there's any kind of opportunity Opportunity to partner on a workshop such as the art therapy workshop because they are Montgomery County students. Um, I, I think that you know that that opportunity and just like capitalizing on that um, would would be helpful. And even even technical support like providing us with some guidance on um, and opportunities on where um, where the programs are. I think those would be helpful as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah and then I also know uh, funding is a huge issue. I know that is what. It was two years ago during the pandemic. You have a one million dollar grant for the community, and over seventy organizations apply, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, that just speak about the need of the community and the limitation of fundings Absolutely. that Absolutely. that we are facing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rivera, Evan. Um, first of all, thank you so much. I um, I had the pleasure of seeing. Um, both the African American and the Asian American Health Initiative be born from 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 the beginning, and um, we always, at least with the with the Latino Health Initiative, have had such a great relationship with both health um, programs. And um, but I, I also think it's important to understand a little bit the logistics of the, the initiatives because although they are part of HHS, they have they each have a board that kind of sets the goals and the mission 
of the different initiatives on how they're going to. And the whole point, I think, of having them separately was because each population knows what is needed and how they're going to target those issues. Now, you guys have a bigger challenge, I always said, because at least with the Latino Health Initiative, we have a common language. You know, we at least we have that. With the Asian American Health Initiative, you guys have so many different populations that you bring together. And and I always thought that that was, you know, quite challenging as um, my colleague Miss Yang said. Um, but you still somehow manage to be able to find common ground in certain areas. And I know mental health has always been one of those um, and suicide rates among young Asian Americans, it's, you know, it's one of those, and hypertension um, and, other, and other areas. So thank you for the work that, that you're doing. But to Ms. Yang's point, um, and, and, and you don't have to be diplomatic, um, <laughs> but what is it, you know, how can we support you, um, you know, to do better? Because just just as the Latino community is very shy about asking for services or even asking for for evaluations, you know, for their children if they need IEPs and so on, they're very shy about it. Uh, they're just happy they're here. They're happy they're part of the system, right? So it, it's 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 a different relationship that we have to have with certain communities. Um, how can we help you to do a better job? since we are the communications <laughs> and engagement committee to be able to engage better with, uh, especially with the Asian American population? Yeah, um, I, I think it's it's one of those questions. And, and, and as you said, I don't want to be diplomatic. It's something that I can definitely certainly talk to my um, you know managers about and get back. Um, but I, I think just the openness, just bringing us to the table, I think that's very important. Um, just hearing the voices. A um, lot of times, you know, um, the suicide rates are high, but then it's not always discussed in the Asian American communities, right? I think um, if there's an opportunity, um, just, you know, have us be represented as well. I, I think that's the main thing. And then in terms of anything more, I can certainly uh, get back on that. <laughs> yeah. well, thank you so much. Um, we appreciate the conversation. And, and um, as you said, the intent was to ensure that if our community, if our families, if our students were not aware of the um, Asian American Health Initiative, that they would be made aware by us speaking and talking with you today. You have some really great pamphlets that um, we'll try to figure out how we can get them to our families because I, I was flipping through, like this is a graphic novel and this is something that our students typically gravitate towards like when they can see and read and kind of put it all together were you able to um be a part of our back to school fair this year and maybe that's something that we can yeah, look into not. next year i know we have a variety of community partners but maybe we can figure out how to get you out in front of our families at the beginning of the year and that way they can get information and see um what services you provide and how they can go about accessing that. I mean, that's just one way. Um, and then you can have your materials there to pass out. But um, as our, um, so what we'll do is we'll put your information, if you can send anything that you have that you would want us to be able to put on our um, board docs so that our community can go and access. And that way, um, if there are students, uh, well maybe we can work through Sammy, Mr. Saeed, to um, <laughs> Mr. Saeed to let our um, students know mm -hmm. that there's information available for them to access. Yeah, you've been so patient, so thank you for sticking <laughs> you so much. it out with us. We do really appreciate um, you and all of our community partners. We are just really going to make sure that not only do we continue to elevate, but that we value the voices of our community partners. We want all of our families to know what's out there and to be able to access that. And we said it, um, or I'll say this, um, education is everybody's business. That's my belief. And we want to ensure that our partners are connecting, right? So one of our priorities is two-way communication. We can do 
we could always do a better job at how we communicate with and to our community partners and vice versa. So um, we hope that people were um, informed today. They found value in hearing from our commu community partners and learning something about each of you. So thank you. thank you. And at this time, if there are no further questions, we are going to go ahead and adjourn our committee meeting. So thank you.